It's Monday morning party, people, and that means it's time for another Countdown to Classic. This is a podcast that educates, informs, and gossips about World of Warcraft Classic. Each week, we discuss the news, hot-button issues, and content of the highly anticipated World of Warcraft Classic. I'm your host, Josh Corbett, and this is a show where it's not my opinion on World of Warcraft that counts, but your If you're new to the show, Countdown to Classic goes through your expert input on everything relating to the sure-to-be-amazing World of Warcraft Classic. Now, you all might be asking, Josh, what the hell? Two episodes per week, man. That was the deal. You skipped an episode last week. And you are very right, and I do apologize. But this week, you're going to hear why I was so busy that I had to skip an entry of the show. And when you hear why through this episode and the next, then I think you'll let me off the hook just this one time. And the reason for that is that I'll be playing two very special, very unique interviews this week on the show. Firstly, with someone who was there when World of Warcraft was made, and then with a core member of the Nostarius team who met with Blizzard in that famous get-together at Irvine a couple of years ago. So So today, I'm going to play you the first of those interviews that took place over the weekend with a very special guest, someone who had a big hand in designing the world of World of Warcraft, vanilla WoW developer and 3D level designer John Statz. Now, some of you may have seen the runtime for this episode, and no, you are not seeing things, and yes, every bit of the next three and a half hours is all with John. John could not have been kinder in affording me a vast amount of his personal time over the weekend, and it's something for which I'll always be grateful, and as much as some of you may balk at this runtime... Every minute of what you're about to hear had me on the edge of my seat and is full of things that I would say we simply did not know about the development of World of Warcraft. However, if you do want to cut to certain points of the interview, there is an elaborate list of timestamps in the show notes, so please do check that out as well. Now, John will mention during the interview, he does have a Kickstarter coming up on the 28th of August for his book that he's trying to get off the ground and which I read a preview for and is fantastic. So if you enjoy this interview with John, which I know you will, then please do look for that Kickstarter of John's on the 28th of August, but you'll get more details through the interview. And speaking of support, if you're enjoying these types of in-depth conversations that Countdown to Classic brings you, then please head on over to the show's Patreon page and see how you can help support Countdown to Classic to continue to bring you more interviews just like this one. All the links you'll need are in the show notes for each episode. If you want to hit me up with some feedback or submit a memory lane or anger management of your own, you can always hit me up at feedback at countdowntoclassic.com as well. Also, if you can't get enough of me for some reason, then please do check out my other podcast, The Cinephiles. That's S-I-N-N-E-R-F-I-L-E-S over at cinephiles.com if you haven't already for great comedic takes on all your favourite movies. But with all that said, buckle up as we do the deepest of dives into developing World of Warcraft with John Statz. All right, everyone, welcome to a very special edition of Countdown to Classic. And why is it so special, you might be asking? Well, we actually have an interview with someone who was involved in the making of the game that we've all come to know and love. The game that we spend so much time talking about and obviously listening to this show about, World of Warcraft, someone who was there in the very beginning. And I've got John Stats on the line. And John, please do say hello. Hello there, Josh, and hello to everyone listening. Thank you for having me. My pleasure, mate. Thank you so much for agreeing to come on the show and and do this interview and give me uh, your time uh, out of your day. One thing I should say, sorry, am I pronouncing that correctly? Is it stats? That is correct. I get that answer. uh, I get that question a lot, and it's like cats, you know. (laughs) Yeah. Fantastic. Now, John, 
uh, you were kind enough to basically reply to me on, on Twitter recently and, and be open to the concept of this interview. And one of the reasons um, that uh, obviously people have been drawn to you on Twitter lately is you have been plugging a book that you've been working on and you've been sending out a fair few really interesting quotes about the development of uh, World of Warcraft back in the day. And please just take the time now to tell people about that book that you're working on and, and what went into that project. Project. Yes. Well, um, the book goes all the way back to uh, all the way back to the year 2000, <laughs> and uh, it was just a journal. Uh, my first job in gaming was uh, World of Warcraft. I moved from advertising. I was in New York City, Madison Avenue, ad agency type of guy. When I went, when I went to Blizzard, I didn't own a pair of jeans. It was uh, it was kind of funny, but uh, advertising wasn't my thing. It was kind of boring, so I did levels. I did Quake levels on the side, and since Blizzard was my first job, I had um, it blew me away. The first day just blew me away, and it was because I thought I knew. I thought I had a decent idea of what the gaming industry was like. Uh, through the 90s, late 90s, I was following the plan updates of the popular developers in the first-person shooter community. And everything I learned from those guys, Blizzard does differently, okay? So that was kind of an eye-opener. And as the project progressed, um, things were getting worse and worse for a while for me, especially for Dungeons. So I thought, well, you know what? This is so bad. This might make a really good story. And so I started interviewing everybody on the uh, team, like finding out what do animators do? Like, what's their process? What's their pipeline? What do the game designers do? Like what, you know, when, when they don't have tools exposed to them, you know, what, what's their uh, methodology? And I basically interviewed everyone in, Pretty much the uh, the team certainly, but uh, uh, Mike Morheim and the founder Alan Adham, um, and just got as much info as I could. And uh, I'm leaving computer game development. I'm going to board game development, and I thought this would be a really good way to just put a really honest book out there. Uh, and uh, I'm pretty proud of it. Well, there's a number of quotes that you've been sharing with us via Twitter, and you were also kind enough to send me a bit of a preview of your book. And I, I plowed through the first hundred or so pages that you were kind enough to send me. And, and I've got to say, I really did enjoy it. It's a great read. And I'm sitting here with my copy in front of me for this interview, full of highlights, full of written notes. So <laughs> I've got a bunch of questions yeah. for you. And you've been kind I enough to, it. yeah, you've been kind enough to say that, um, you're more than happy for me to, as I do on the show. So quote a few excerpts from your book back to you and sure. get further comment. Now, I just want to start here. One short thing. You talk about, obviously, your very briefly, your journey from Madison Avenue to Irvine. Was it hard to leave? And you said you take a $30,000 pay cut. Was it hard to leave that $80,000 a year gig in 2001 for a $50,000 gig out on the West Coast where, you know, you, you weren't from that area and it was taking a boatload less money? Yeah, it really was, but I was at a point where, uh, it's funny. I was given a job offer at the ad agency. I was an independent contractor, which is a fancy way of saying a freelancer, but I would, I would work on the premises at the places and they wanted, uh, they wanted to hire me. And I was there for a month before Blizzard actually FedExed their offer to me. So after a month, <laughs> Of, of, I mean, I was actually making more than 80,000 as a freelancer. So I was doing really well. I was pretty much at the top of my game in New York, but the work itself wasn't very artistically satisfying. Um, I had, I was making enough money I could take, I think the longest, I took eight months off to, to build a number of levels. And when I was building, it was, it's hard to get 120 hour weeks into something like you have to have the desk right there. I mean, it's, I was working crazy hours. Basically I built up a portfolio. I wasn't even trying to do it. Um, just doing, uh, capture the flag maps and, uh, uh, single player maps for the quake series, first person shooter games. And I wasn't very satisfied. I was, I was, you know, I, 
pretty much made it to the pharmaceutical pharmaceutical advertisement, which is it's probably the best pain advertising there is out there. It's not very exciting, but really none of it is. So it was just more of an artistic thing. Um, and I don't know. It was it was it was a hard transition, though. Um, when you leave New York, you're not leaving your job. You're leaving your apartment. Anyone from New York knows the uh, the the significance of leaving behind a uh, an apartment because they are so hard to find. Uh, and I moved from expensive New York City to expensive uh, <laughs> Newport Beach. So that wasn't so much of a transition, but I'd never really lived out west. I'm from Ohio, which is, uh, you know, very humid, you know, a lot of rainfall. And, uh, yeah, in the desert in Southern California, it's a different environment. But uh, uh, that's that was almost a good thing. I was a fish out of water there. So mm. I spent all my time at Blizzard anyway. So <laughs> that's what I wanted to do. If I'm going to move across the country, I'm going to spend my time. I'm not doing 40-hour weeks. Forget that. <laughs> well, you mentioned scratching that sort of um... – you know, creative itch by way, you know, the advertising wasn't really doing it for you. And just to give people a, a light introduction, you mentioned you, you work on um, dabbling with Quake and, and uh, level design there. Just tell people a little bit about how you fell into the world of level design by spending your free time mucking around with some levels on Quake. Yeah, that's actually a funny story. I was a Macintosh person because all my life, uh, I started Macintoshes when they first came, like 1987. Boy, this dates me. Um, <laughs> when I was in college, uh, they got a big grant. So I was Mac, 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 all Macintosh stuff. No PC work. When I saw my roommate had gotten, we, it was called Scoopware, where they would just scoop up a whole bunch of tools that they found online put it on a CD, put it in CompUSA stores and sold it for like $15. He got it. And one of the things he had was an, a level editor, a 3D level editor for, uh, oh, I think it was Quake 2. No, no, no. It's for Quake 1. That's right. And he's like, John, all those uh, modules, we were in big in Dungeons and Dragons. I was, I, I built homemade modules, you know, since I was in, I don't know, grade school. And the idea of walking around in one of my dungeons for uh, Dungeons and Dragons just blew my mind. The next day, I bought a PC, top of the end PC, um, and just started teaching myself. Uh, from there, you find tools and tutorials and mod groups. I joined a group called uh, Loki's Minions Capture the Flag. It was a pretty big uh, – it's actually – there's a league still for it. Uh, for Quake 2 enthusiasts who uh, enjoy it's a really fast game and that's kind of I started painting textures for 3D level designers I didn't consider myself uh, good enough to, to build my own geometry so I just did textures for a while <laughs> then I picked up the editor got used to some of the uh, terminology and the tools and uh, it's a it's a long long road Uh First-person shooters were really hard to work with. It was a very time-intensive uh, uh, job. Like I, I would describe to build a level, it's three steps. Step one is spend 200 hours on your level. Step two is spend another 200 hours on your level. And then step three was you do a final compile of your level, and then you're done. So uh, I kind of cut my teeth out on, on you know just homemade stuff. Okay, well, just in terms of you know, I had a. I, I'm going to be blatantly honest with you. I'm far from the the world's greatest um, uh, tech guy. I'm not the most knowledgeable gamer out there in the world either. I just you know muck around with these things for a bit of fun, and my yeah. fans and listeners know <laughs> so much more about the industry than I do. But I did find yeah. it funny that one of the questions I had actually came up from a few listeners and and i know many people know the answer to this question and you've touched on it a little bit but just to explain to people i'll read you a short quote from your book and it says the following 
Perhaps it would help if I succinctly explain what 3D level designers actually do. We move things around. We place elements to establish a mood and allow room for traffic and gameplay. We arrange things to make areas interesting and beautiful. We arrange art assets, trees, bones, and other props. Level designers create play spaces like architecture or landscapes. So my question from that short quote is... You know, have, with a few people wondering out loud exactly what a level designer does do, outside of that description in the book, which is a great one, what's the job description and the kind of trials and tribulations of being a 3D level designer on a game like World of Warcraft? Um, believe it or not, it's easier on World of Warcraft than in most other games. Uh, the play spaces are fairly agnostic to the gameplay in most of the boss fights. In fact, uh, before we had dungeons working, we would always test all the monsters. All, like all the boss fights would be out in Westfall, just by the tower. We would just spawn the monster there and that would be the fight for, you know, whatever boss mob or, you know, uh, whatever, whatever, you know, you were testing. But, uh, I describe level design as the very center of game development's uh, Venn diagram. You know those 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 graphs where the, there are circles of uh, there's sets and subsets where the circles intersect. That's kind of like right. the uh, the shared space. Uh, that's where level design is. You're you're an advocate for a number of disciplines. You're an advocate for lore to make sure, you know, the story is being told. You're an advocate of uh, art, make it pretty uh, programming. You don't want to clutter the space and bring down the frame rate. Uh, obviously, uh, you don't want to interfere with design. Uh, you want to keep stairs away from combat. Uh, you want to, uh, and, and also production. You, you want to work on schedule. So sometimes you have to re rob Peter to pay Paul in some of those instances. And level designers get a reputation of not listening to anyone. And it's not really the case. And it, it's, I think that section of the books is where I'm defending level designers a little bit because they get blamed for a lot of things. And, you know, that's where the rubber meets the road, you know, as far as the game, you know, everything happens there. Thanks so much for that. That sort of, you know, it, it helps for, I'm sure, a lot of people just to get a bit of a better idea of exactly what goes into your role, um, despite the fact that I'm sure a lot of people are like, uh, Josh, duh, stupid question. We know what level designers do. <laughs> but Well, you know, well, actually, what's uh, one thing I should articulate is there's two types of level designers. This might have been what you were uh, driving at. Mm -hmm. I'm a 3D level designer. Okay, I'm starting, I'm pushing polygons, okay? I've, I'm using a wireframe, you know, I'm manipulating a wireframe mesh in a 3D editor. We use 3D Studio Max. Uh, for a while, we used uh, BSP editors like shooters used back in the 90s. And uh, then we had the exterior level designers. They used landscaping tools, and that's all proprietary tools that Blizzard builds where they have the 3D mesh of the terrain, you know, they, they arrange props and stuff. Two very, very, very different disciplines, though. Uh, very different disciplines. Um, 3D level designers, it's a lot more art intensive. You know, you're creating stuff from scratch. Uh, it's, it's a lot, <laughs> it's, you know, especially with BSP editors, it's a lot harder. So there are two, two, two ki kinds of uh, level designers with, with WoW. Sure. Now, you mentioned that software uh, of 3D Studio Max, and one of the, the ongoing themes through the first little, uh, the first bit of your book is some of the uh, issues that Blizzard was having just with almost uh, the software that you were using and the constant struggle with whether or not you were using the right software, if you should jump ship and, and try something else out. But I'll just read you again another short quote where you said that, and what we're reading, what I'm reading about obviously happens in the early days of 2001, because you mentioned that after six months of trying to build a world, we still hadn't figured out how to create caves, dungeons, buildings, or cities. Uh, and one of the questions that I, I want to ask from there is, 
um, the software struggles that you were having, that, that was six months into your gig at Blizzard around sort of, you know, that March 2001 type um, right. a timeline. Right. Now, Blizzard has been working on the game, or at least, you know, from a, a um, idea concept point uh, for about two years at, at this juncture. So right. was there a point when you were questioning yourself for joining Blizzard going, shit, these guys can't get their shit together? You know, what, what, what was the problem with the software? Well, what took care of that fear? Uh, I mean, I'm an anxious person as a, you know, just, you know, crossing the street. But uh, honestly, what allayed that fear was how smart they were. They were sharp as attack. The programmers were smart. The designers were smart. The producers. And the fact that the employees actually revered the uh, the founders of the company, which was something unheard of in, the, in advertising. I, I thought they were joking when they were, stop, when, when they were talking about how smart the, uh, the HQ uh, people are. I thought, you know, usually that's sarcastic remark, but, um, no, I was actually, I was feeling good that these guys are really smart. Like, uh, when I guessed why they did this or why they did that, when I first joined, I'm talking day one, I was wrong with every single assumption, with every single assumption. This is after five and a half years of fairly intensive level design development as a hobby at home. But following the, you know, uh, first person shooter community, um, they knew what they were doing. Uh, but building an MMO, what we were doing is we were pl- applying uh, first person shooter tech and processes and production pipelines. We were trying to apply that to an MMO. And MMOs have so many more restrictions than first person shooters and especially what we were building. So we were just failing. I mean, it was, there's a chapter called nine years down the tubes. And when you're working, you know, 90 plus hour weeks for nine months, and I'm talking because I loved it, you know, it was uninterrupted and all that work goes away. That's a, that's a moment. That's, but you know, that's how bad (laughs) things were. I mean, (laughs) we were using a BSP editor, which is a very, Ooh, it's, it's, it's a bare bones editor. It just doesn't scale to complexity the way like 3ds uh, studio max does. Um, and it was just very hard to work uh, trying to build dungeons with BSP editors. So um, got it now. Yeah. We, just one last question sort of generally about um, uh, Blizzard, and, and we might have some more later on, but I, I do want to get down to the nitty-gritty of what so many people are waiting to hear about in terms of the specific dungeon designs that you had a hand in. But one last sort of general question, and this is from a listener named um, uh, Cream Cake one over at uh, the WoW Classic subreddit, and it just revolves around um, something that you do touch on in your book is you talk about, you know, life at Blizz during that time, back in the day, the late late nights that some of you were pulling and you talk about the Monday and Wednesday late nights, the counter strike games that you might've mucked around with for about an hour (laughs) after work. Oh yeah. But the listener asked this and they asked generally, what was your lifestyle and that of the lads around you? Like, did you live and breathe the development process and work 18 hour days in full immersion mode? Like people played the game or was it more of a relaxed process? I've always wanted to know if you were full on on turbo nerds like us who played the game uh, that's a good question it's a little mix uh i worked longer hours than anyone on the vanilla wow dev team so i am one of the outliers okay uh and it's just in my opinion level design you know it's i i, I saw blizzard as a patron more than a employer so and I, I also, again, I was a fish out of water. I actually didn't like Orange County very much. Uh, Irvine is a planned city. All the trees grow in straight rows, and it's manicured lawns, and it's so alien <laughs> to me <laughs> that uh, I didn't see myself setting roots there. So as long as I was going to be there, I was not going to waste my time. Uh, I, I really did consider you know, time outside of Blizzard as a waste of my time. 
Um, but I was an outlier. Uh, I was, I was familiar with MMOs. Um, I remember when EverQuest came out, that was, I believe, the same time Quick 3 came out. And I had to make the decision, do I want to build levels or do I want to play EverQuest? I can't do both. And so I watched my roommate play room, uh, uh, EverQuest <laughs> over my shoulder while I built levels. So most of the developers aren't MMO players, okay? It's hard enough hmm. to get people that are really good. Um, and I'm talking specifically more about the, the artists and the programmers. Okay. Mm -hmm. Some of our, actually half of, I would say half of our programmers are really hardcore EverQuest guys, at least back in the uh, vanilla days. Um, but almost none of the artists, it, it didn't appeal to them. It was just, uh, it was a little bit too, uh, MMOs were also very punishing games back then so you were comparing apples to oranges when we we're talking about uh uh being fans of that genre uh before world of warcraft came out it was it was a it was a genre that was designed to punish the players i mean it was it was pretty brutal um i even made this attempt to get the dungeon group to play through a dungeon i was the only one playing wow to the level where i was grouping up and going into dungeons at one point during uh vanilla development and i described this i have a i have a series of promotional articles that i described this in great detail how i had the artists hated it so much i had actually turned them against <laughs> <laughs> dungeon play i mean they it, it was just a terrible debacle uh they th th we were playing on characters i yeah it was a wailing caverns they had maybe played through 10th level maybe 15th when we got to 20th they didn't recognize their spells okay and it took so long to and this is pre-alpha cheat up a, a a character uh you had to have the right cheat codes and stuff like that it took at least an hour then you had to have a stable server. If you didn't have a stable server, all that stuff would be lost. And so after a bunch of, you know, failed starts and stops, we finally get in. And now I'm explaining tanking and crowd control. Just the very basic fundamentals of aggro control was a big deal. And they were so burnt out by the time they didn't want to hear it. They just wanted to rush the monsters, <laughs> which is not what you do in dungeons. You're not going to have a fun experience. And, uh, yeah, it didn't go well. Okay. So, yeah. Well, what about that camaraderie between, you know, team two that you talk about, you know, guys like Mark Kern, Chris Metzen, yourself, like right. what was that kind of bond between all of you like, and who, who really sort of helped to, to, to tighten the bonds between what must have been a rather enduring project? Um, yeah, it was, I mean, I'm still in contact with a lot of them. Uh, it's, yeah, it is. I mean, you do anything intensive like that. I imagine, you know, going through boot camp or something like that. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it, it, it's kind of funny. It was kind of a mix, some cross disciplines. Um, there's some guys that, you know, I just, it's almost, I'm more of the higher, you know, like the harder work ethic kind of guys. Like we would see each other on weekends, you know, and late at m night we'd, you know, sit around and talk, you know, you get to see what people really want to work on when it's like 11 o'clock at night or on a weekend. It's, People are just, you know, it's, 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 it's cooler, you know? Mm. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, I imagine, you know, it's, it's, it's similar to, I think, a lot of stressful environments, you know, even if you, you have squabbles and you have spats and stuff like that, you still have a lot of, uh, respect for one another. All right. Well, look, I've, I've gone easy on you these first 20 or so minutes. I've given you all the layup questions and now I've got to get down to the nitty gritty stuff. So buckle up because here we I'm go. Ready. All right. Fantastic. I'm bracing myself here. Excellent. Now, when I say that, what I mean is we're, we're going to get more into specifically, um, you know, your work on specific dungeons and, sure. and some of the arguments that you mentioned in your book that were taking place regarding pretty big development decisions about the dungeons 
in game. And I want to start with this one. And that's, um, you mentioned that, uh, there was a, a rather a first big I- initial, um, internal struggle about the dungeons in the game revolved around the, uh, public versus instance dungeon. And I'll just read you a short quote again from your book. And, and it goes as following. Um, There were several team meetings about whether World of Warcraft should abandon the paradigm of public dungeons established by the undisputed king of the MMO genre, EverQuest, in lieu of private dungeons called instances. The team was fairly split on the matter. The biggest concern with instance dungeons was that they were anti-social experiences experiences in what was supposed to be a social game. Now, my question for following on from that quote is can you tell us uh, about that division within the team and can you remember who was pro public dungeons and who was pro instances and what kind of chat went on about it um yes i i remember i mean there were so many meetings that when a meeting was cold for like a team meeting uh, half the people would just roll their eyes because they're sick of hearing about it, which is kind of funny. And it was, there was a lot of vocal EverQuest, uh, enthusiasts. That's all they'd played, you know, that they, they wanted something that was familiar to them. They had very fond memories of, uh, grouping up in lower guck or, uh, you know, just that was the process. That's how you found a group. You would go there kill some monsters and while you were killing monsters there'd be you know a quorum of people who could then okay let's take out this dungeon and that dungeon was not instanced it was a public dungeon that's that's actually why why uh all our wow vanilla wow dungeons were so ridiculously big is because we were following an earlier paradigm where the bigger the dungeon the more content there is for everyone. Mm. But you don't actually have to do that with an instance dungeon. You know, you can just uh, have a, the same, everybody playing the same material. It doesn't matter. And it, it just never really occurred to anyone. Um, I hadn't played EverQuest enough to really have a strong opinion about it. But it was mostly a battle between the EverQuest uh, uh, gurus. Um, yeah, some 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 wanted to change it, some didn't. And that was the fear that we were taking away that dynamic that because it was actually that's where the community was. They were they were meeting around the dungeon and to completely wipe that out and we actually didn't replace it with anything. We we tried a number of things. We we tried the meeting stones which didn't work. Um the reason why, okay, so Whaling Caverns is a great example. When I built the Whaling ca- Caverns. Your first dungeon, I, right? Th- that was my first dungeon actually in game. Uh, Ankarash was what I built earlier before that, believe it or not. That was oh. the first dungeon I'd ever built. Ah. And yeah, because it was just, it was whatever, we'd have a plan and we would pick things that that's definitely going to go in the game. Okay. And of course, they pick on Karash, which definitely wasn't in the game when it shipped. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's that's what I started with anyway. Right. But um, Whaling Caverns was the first that I got textured. And I built the cave. And I, I love caves. My family goes on vacation. We uh-huh. love tours through caves and stuff like that. So I really wanted to do take the time and build a really convincing cave, which in my opinion, really hadn't existed in in video games uh, before that. So I did the Wailing Caverns, and it was the the very end of the dungeon was that big round room. The big round room with the the plants coming down in the center with that uh, uh, Polisiosaur in the center. I can't remember what that, that monster's name is, but... That was the end. And then Alan Adham, okay, he was our lead designer. He said, John, this looks just fantastic. This will be great. Over here, and he goes to the very end of the dungeon. He Mm -hmm. says, this is where we'll put the instance line, and then you can really, really build the dungeon. (laughs) And I was expecting the instance line going to be right at the beginning of the dungeon. Mm. And... 
he had to explain it to me a number of times because that just blew me away, that thinking. He wanted people to play and get used to the flavor of it before. He didn't want this harsh transition of outdoor, 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 then bam, you're in a dungeon, okay? He wanted to introduce uh, the elite mobs, uh, which kind of didn't make sense because you couldn't solo them. Mm. Um, but he wanted people to gradually group up and then ease into the, uh, the dungeon. He did just want to hit people with, uh, grouped monsters where he had to do crowd control and he had to do tanking and off tanking and all this crazy stuff all at once. So he, he, he tried to ramp you up slowly. That's, that's what his thinking was. Um, as it turned out, it didn't work that way. People didn't want that. You know, people, all those areas before the dungeons, like the Razorfin dungeons, there's that outdoor area before you get into the actual dungeons. Mm-hmm. Those are, that's supposed to just be the common areas is what they called it, mm. uh, outside the dungeons. So, um, well, you talk just to go on a very slight tangent here. And it is something that you you do I mention a couple of times in your book, and I'd love to sort of let, allow you the moment to gush about it now. You obviously also worked on non-instanced caves or dungeon E type, you know, that feel of an area. Oh, yeah. And yeah. you just said that you love caves in real life. So what were some of your favorite non-instanced cave areas that you worked on in the game? Um, let's see. The winter spring caves were good. Um, I built like a dozen of them. I like, a, I think I built 15 gold mines and like a dozen mountain caves. Uh, oh, I was just happy to get them in. It was, it was probably my biggest contribution to the project as much as, as important as the dungeons, the instance dungeons were. It, I thought it was more important because the original plan was to have one or two mountain caves and copy the exact same cave throughout the entire game. One or two gold mines and a copy those gold mines throughout the entire game. And that was just, that was the time budget we had. And so that's where I rolled up my sleeves and I worked on weekends and I pr- produced variations. So I was just happy to, uh, um, to be making variations where people would have some sense of exploration. Um, yeah, there's a whole chapter on, you know, how we, that came about, (laughs) Right. but, uh, yeah, my favorite caves boy. Um, I think the winter spring one, just because the, it, it had a, it had such a different opening. I was also big into making a different opening, which the exterior level designers loved because, uh, they, all the exterior guys loved unique assets. They actually couldn't create any of their own assets. They used whatever the artists or, uh, uh, anyone made them. So anytime you give them something else, it's a new toy. And when I was able to vary, to make variations of the gold mine entrances, they were super stoked because that's, that's what made their zone, you know, a mm. little bit more unique and a little mm. bit more special. So it was honestly, there's, there's, I was probably more proud of the gold mines than the caves. Uh, after the whaling caverns, I had had it with stalactites and stalagmites. Each one was individually modeled. Oh. I, I, I mean, it was a pain in the butt, wow. but I eventually got good at it. I got fast at it. I've got a process that's, uh, pretty quick. I, I, I studied them enough so that I get the parabolic, uh, swoop of the, uh, of the, uh, the pinnacles mm. and, 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 uh, the pillars and stuff. But, um, yeah, I think the gold mines are probably my favorite. Uh, the badlands, no one's ever been to the, <laughs> the gold mines in the badlands. I like the Mulgore, uh, uh, newbie, um, uh, dungeon. Mm-hmm. There's a gold mine that was so big and so overspawned that <laughs> you level up past level five before you get to the very end, at least back <laughs> in the day. And by the time you turn in your quest, it's gray and you don't get any experience. And the, and, and the, uh, the loot that you get from completing the zone quest is below what you really even want. So it was kind of, uh, kind of funny learning experience with that. Did you have a hand in the, the Banathil, uh, Barrow Den at all in Teldrassil? Remember that one? 
Um, let's see. I don't know. I did a few Barrow Dens. Jose, um, Jose, oh, I, I, oh boy, I, I'm messing up his name. It's been so long. Jose was the one who actually, what, Jose built the first Barrow Den. Hmm. And what I would do is I'd build like three or four variations right. of that. Okay. Because he would build the geometry, but then, I don't know how many months later, once textures were painted for it, I could say, okay, this is the texture set. This is what we could do with it. And that's kind of how I did all the variants. Um, the funnest ones were always the, the crypts. The mm. crypts, uh, the mausoleums were the most fun to work with because it's, uh, uh, there were so many props to work with, uh, in Duskwood. And I think it's just, uh, it's a meme that, uh, is very familiar to us all. We all react to spider webs and, you know, graves and bones and stuff like that. That's something very visceral that we can identify with. And uh, it's always been just a good satisfaction to work with those. Well, I probably would be remiss here if I didn't bring up now that you've raised it, uh, that concept of crypts, because um, it has come up a, a couple of times in the questions from listeners. And th they sort of say that... Um, you know the Karazan crypts. Um, you know what? What was the initial plan oh, yeah. for an area <laughs> like that? Because that's a question that came up a couple of times. Sure, sure. Okay, so Karazan was. Oh boy, how should I say this? Probably the single most painful dungeon. It was built. That's the first dungeon I built using the BSP editor. And it was enormous. We couldn't, it took like 30 minutes just to load into the editor. Um, we couldn't compile it. We couldn't run it. Or it, it was just six months of just maybe five months of building that. And we canceled that. That was when we, nine months down the tubes, when we switched from a BSP editor to uh, 3D Studio Max. Then... Uh, another level designer built it, but it was too small. It, he was following the lore that called for a super tall structure, but the, the, there was no open floor space. And so that got fully textured, and we had to throw it out completely, completely throw it out. And he had spent how many months working on that? And so I started – it actually had stops and starts – before I caught, uh, caught it again at the end of the development. And by that time, we were learning that we had too much content. And that was where there's only so much loot we could give players that would be meaningful. And so Karazana was originally going to have a whole bunch of crypts underneath it. Uh, I had wine cellars down there. I was just, this was, I was also kind of burnt out and just, just cranking with everything that I could think of, uh, Karazan was way scaled back. It was way too big. Uh, we had subsections of Karazan that were flooded. <laughs> uh, and the, the crypts and stuff around it were just more micro dungeons. These were the non-instanced dungeons. We called them micros. Uh, a micro dungeon was just a uh, thing you pop in and out. And we learned we just didn't have enough loot to give to players at the high end. Uh, all the Black Rock dungeons, that's, mm -hmm. that's kind of like the high end dungeons. And so that's, we, we punted, uh, Kara, Karazan to, uh, after, long after, uh, I think that was, uh, Burning Crusade, right? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. we punted or, or right before Burning Crusade. I can't remember, but, what I did is I made a whole bunch of <laughs> uh, dungeons that just we didn't have room for. And the level designer, I think Matt Sanders, liked the arrangements that he built around it. He just didn't want to rip those uh, openings out of the zone. So I think we just put in you know, blockers to try to keep people out of them of course, and that didn't work. And some of the names I came up with, I would, I would name rooms temporary names and let Metzen rename them, you know, something proper. And because I was just working on my own, uh, just making content on my own, uh, I was just naming stuff. And I'm named a couple things, uh, like the upside down uh, flooded room of the upside down hell. It was a, uh, a big trouble in little China reference mm. that I, 
I remember there's a whole bunch of dead bodies chained underwater. It was just a really grisly thing. And I was trying to do something different with a crypt. <laughs> I mean, this is just crazy stuff. And so I just followed the big trouble with little China meme and just stole it, put it right in there. And I remember listening to Metzen being asked one of the localizers uh, who translate the game to Korean was sitting right outside my office. And this is after they'd been closed. They get text. The text, when you name something, just goes to a text file, okay? And you don't know what it's referring to. And then Metzen would actually look, because you can't just run around in a game and see everything that way. You'd miss it. So he would see, he'd looked at, at these names that I'm coming up with, and he's like, what the hell are these? These aren't, <laughs> I did not approve of that. I don't know what that's in the game for. That better not be in the game. And... <laughs> I'm I'm li- listening to this going, oh, <laughs> it's like, wow. well, shame on him for not getting the big trouble in Little China reference. So, <laughs> I, you know, I'm not backing down from that quite, quite all the way. But uh, if I have a speaker, uh, I'll have to bring that up. Right. And, and let me tell you, the those never got actually into the build because obviously players couldn't get down there legitimately. So, uh, yeah, there's they're still all down there mm-hmm. and there's a whole bunch of mystery about it. So that's. Yeah, and, and a lot of content got cut mm. uh, because we just didn't have – and that's one of the limits to MMOs um, is how many items you can give to players that they care about. Because if it's a duplicate reward for doing this task or goal or quest, then if that's a duplicate, that all the content kind of goes out the window. I mean that's really not content for them and – yeah, I know you can make alts and stuff like that, but we had so much bigger fish to fry. We did not need more zones of duplicate content. So that's that's kind of how we why we caught cut a lot of stuff out of the game. Mm. Well, you, I, I appreciate the reasoning behind the decision, as you said, sort of maybe too much too soon in terms of the amount of content in the game. But I'm so glad you said the magic words um, because it, it's great when questions I've got lined up come up organically during the interview. But you, you, you <laughs> said that um, you worked on so many dungeons that, that just had to be cut. They, they didn't make it to the game. Now, I know my listeners would kill me if I didn't follow up on this. What did sure. you work on that you can remember that was cut? And I'll just preface this with a, a question from a listener, Lol Basket, who says this. Is there any cut content that we don't know of? It's no secret that zones like Kelthalas, Northrend, Gilneas, and all the other places, uh, uh, all other places mentioned were cancelled. But were there any dungeons, raids, battlegrounds, unique subzones or quest lines in those places? or even in zones that did make the cut for vanilla or zones that we didn't even know were cut, um, possibly places like the Broken Isles or things like that on the world map that were planned right. but then right. scrapped. What what did you work on that got the axe? Well, I, I, I don't know if you don't know about it. You data miners are very efficient. Um, you found pretty much a lot of the secrets. Uh, I will say there was going to be a haunted area in Iron Forge. Like the three main capital cities, the Ogremar, they were all going to have a, um, um, like a dungeon area. Mm. I forget the one. Uh, there's the stockades in Stormwind, mm-hmm. Hellfire, something or another. Is it Hellfire Peninsula? That doesn't make sense. That's no. in, in BC. Uh, yeah, but something under uh, Ogremar. Um, right. And in Ironforge, there is going to be that section. I didn't build it. I know Aaron started copying and pasting. That was easy. We would just copy and paste, you know, rooms that he'd already built and, you know, put a fog effect down there and ghosts. You got yourself a a new dungeon. But, uh, oh, yeah, I remember the ones that I got that got. (laughs) I drove the game designers crazy asking them about um, two things in particular were the Dragon Isles. Um, The very I remember the concept art. Uh, for the original World of Warcraft, the cover art had this giant uh, old god octopus building that I just freaking loved. And it was one of the – and this was actually one of the first things I'd ever built in-game. Um, probably not as proud of I'm, – I'm looking back with rose-colored uh, glasses. It's probably not as well 
meshed out, not as well designed as it should have been. Didn't have a lot of floor space, and so they cut that out. The concept was there was going to be four islands filled with dragons because we were go- we were going to get a dragon, and I think lore wise, and this is a lot of the uh, game designers don't like the fact that all of our dragons are good except the black dragons. Like, <laughs> look like they'll they'll roll their eyes and go, "Why would you make lore where all the dragons are good?" <laughs> because that's what I want to fight, you know. So uh, I'm sure there are some uh, bones to contend with because they wanted to fight different kinds of dragons and stuff like that, but. Uh, Betson was uh, drawing a line in the sand. They said, "No, no, no, no. This is this is old lore. We can't uh, change this." So that might have had something to do with it, but I think it was just way too much content. Uh, that and the top of Carison. I told you Carison was so much bigger than what it was. We had the flooded section. I built Carison with Aaron Keller, so I kind of laid out the, the the tower and built the exterior of the tower. Um, I kind of started, I think, on the stables, and Aaron took over, and he just fleshed out the floor plan that I did while I built the raid dungeon that was actually supposed to be at the very end of Karazhan. When you get to the top of the the, uh, tower, there's this uh, faked effect uh, effect of you being in space, and there's like these spiraling type of asteroids floating in I don't know, another mm. dimension. In in the far distance, there's this spire uh, structure that you're supposed to teleport to. And it's it's actually faked uh, perspective. It's actually not as small as... I just shrunk it down and it looks like it's further away. But you were supposed to teleport out there. Then you teleport to that asteroid and it was supposed to be all demons uh, mm. running around. Uh, I built the asteroid. It was supposed. It was very high concept. That's where I think World of Warcraft uh, stumbles a little bit when we try to pull off a really high concept stuff. The emerald, the emerald dream was a zone that got cut. Uh, it was, it was just silly <laughs> walking around in it. Mm. Uh, is just it, it doesn't you know i think uh the world tree was not the most popular with the team you know it's just a little bit hard to uh work with as an asset and anything titan anything titans the titans were a big pain in the ass because how do you design architecture for something that's supposed to create the entire world yeah you know i mean it, you'd be like a little uh mouse or a little cockroach running across this giant empty you know it's the most boring architecture in the world you know so mm. uh yeah that that uh but anyway the stuff that got cut uh was yeah that was the asteroid that was a little bit high concept not the prettiest dungeon um it it, it needed a lot of texture work to actually pull it off and uh people were burnt out yeah it was uh yeah, but those are the two ones that I remember. Well, you just mentioned um, basically the higher concept that Blizzard got, the more uh, you're increasing your chances for failure, perhaps. So one question that a listener had that I thought was a great one was from listener Asmo, who says, while developing raids, were there rules for the player experience? For example, Witcher 3 had a 40-second rule, which accounted for the attention spans of players by keeping them always looking at something interesting. Or... So were the raids developed more organically than that, or were they developed by people who just had very good instincts for what would make for a fun environment? And basically, a, a follow-on from that is another listener, Chaos Gandalf, who says, did the team have a set of commandments that you would try to follow when designing dungeons? And my follow-on is, did you just basically try and stick to the keep it simple, stupid rule? Uh, the easy answer is no to all of those questions. Mm-hmm. Uh, nothing is ever written in stone. And that's kind of one of the principles I think Blizzard is founded on. Uh, you can always iterate. You can always improve. Um, <clears throat> not it, I, I would say like the Molten Core, I think they, they, they scripted that. They say they got it done in a week. It definitely wasn't uh, 
it's not how fast you script it. It's how fast you can debug <laughs> the the fight because that's where actually where all the uh, uh, that was that was the unfun part. That was like the work part of scripting dungeons, and I think they just scripted the dungeons as fast as they can. These were uh Scott Mercer was on team 1. He was a uh a level designer on team 1. Uh once the editor was robust enough to get a raid in, you know, he'd been chewing on EverQuest ideas for years and years and years. It took no time for those guys to come up with game mechanics to uh to throw into a, a raid dungeon. And I think the process is what they do is they, yes, there are different roles. Uh, when Rob Pardo designed the uh, character classes, he borrowed from the idea of a football team where there's a quarterback, a halfback, fullback. This is American football as well. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, where there's different roles on the teams. You have a receiver, you have a blocker, you know, and, I think a lot of, and that's, that goes back to Dungeons and Dragons where there's very distinct roles. Uh, I think RPGs have evolved to the point that, okay, it's nice to meet those paradigms, but frankly, it's not as fun when you have, when you're looking for a healer or you're looking for a tank and you can't do content because somebody, you don't have the correct makeup of you, you know your group and that's where the game forces a group of players to either play different characters or play a different way than what they really want to do so i think that's the weakness of roles so but we started that way i think wow is pretty much i mean i think i saw the joke of rogues having a tank spec in their uh you know uh uh talent tree mm. uh because they're so flexible, like, like, you know, you could do a Paladin tank, you do a Paladin, DK, you know, all, but it wasn't like that originally. Um, there was the tank class originally. Mm. And when you're designing a raid, you have the luxury of, okay, so we've got, we got to give something for the rogues to do. That was always the big problem with raids. Rogues, rogues were the pain in the ass. Uh, druids. Oh, we're still a pain in the ass to this day. <laughs> uh, I, I believe it. I, I do believe it because it's a hard. Um, I think the suppressor room in the Deathwing was the first game mechanic in a raid that was designed for the rogues, and you needed rogues to do that, and they loved to be able to contribute <laughs> to that. And I think that's great, but that's the problem when you design a game for roles. So, uh, does that answer your question? Or, uh, absolutely. I, no, absolutely. Okay. So, right. next up, I've got a, another listener question um, from listener Zyle, who says this. We've talked about some cut content, but now, how did the original vision for certain content, such as, you know, Hygel, the Emerald Dream, you know, things that might have come into the game later, and I appreciate that right. some of this stuff might have come post your involvement with Blizzard, but they ask, how did it differ from how that content was eventually implemented? So, was there any planned content? Oh, well, first question... The content that wound up in the game, did it differ from your original plan for it? And part two, is there any planned content that still hasn't made its way into the game? Oh, boy. Um, that's a very fundamental question. Um, planned, let's put that word in quotations. Mm -hmm. Um uh, what, how's it goes? How does it go? The, the, my favorite, there's, there's two good quotes about planning, you know, man plans and then God laughs. But I think a better one is, uh, from Mike Tyson. Uh, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. <laughs> and that is what game development really, I mean, if I were borrowing quotes from outside of World of Warcraft, that is one that I think really applies to game development is if you have seasoned veterans that really know what they're doing, you have guys that don't stick to the plan, who are agile and can admit that they've done things 
that, that their speculation was wrong and they can very quickly and very efficiently and uh, frankly, very frugally change direction when they need to change it to avoid something that's uh, going to produce diminishing returns like a dead end idea or just art that doesn't want to get made uh, or to towards something that is very fruitful, you know, that, that, that's a happy accident or, Oh, this is, this is neat. Uh, so kind of like quests, that's, that's the classic example. A lot of, uh, wow fans know that, uh, our original plan was that the producers of, and this, it's all, it's, it sounds like a joke. The producers in their spare time, the producers in their spare time were going to be, uh, the quest designers. That was that was literally what the game was budgeted for. Like these guys that in their spare time, they'd say, oh, OK, collect a bunch of uh, paws or something, candles. And that would be the quest. But it turned out people wanted more and more quests. That was how you played the game. That's what people wanted. And so they had to rebudget the team and hire a whole bunch of quest designers. And through an accident of user interface, uh, and I, boy, I guess I can go into this. There's a user interface problem where people, once they finished their quests, they would go to another zone. And that's not quests were designed for. Quests were designed to familiarize the player with the zone so that they could then grind up monsters until it was time for them to go to a higher level zone. Well, as players played, they filled up their quest log, turned in their quests, and said, well, I'm done with this zone. I'm now going to the zone that's too high level for me. Mm-hmm. And they'd go there, and it was just very confusing. So we had to fill up the entire zone with quest, 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 quest. And inadvertently, and this is probably the most fascinating things about World of Warcraft, it appeals to the casual player because there are so many quests and that was never part of the plan. It was never part of the plan to make that many quests. And we stumbled into success. And when you talk about the casual player, that is, that's 90% of the audience. That's, it's not the Raiders. It's not the, you know, it's, it's the casual players. That is what's going to really support the, the, the lifetime for your game. Um, so, yeah, making that many quests to make solo play interesting appealed to the casual uh, gamer, which which is funny because that's the gamer that Blizzard really wants to cater to. They want to get those guys that are, you know, uh, what's the quote in the book? Uh, uh, RPGs were dead as far as uh, uh, a computer game goes be- mm-hmm. until Diablo came. Diablo, there was... I mean, it was, it was everyone avoided RPGs like a plague. It was a niche, uh, but Blizzard catered to the casual user. And, you know, they proved that it could be done. So, like, when you plan, uh, yeah, okay, you can make your plans. <laughs> but it's, 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 you know, whoa, let's see, what was left behind? Uh, oh, geez, well, the quests, uh, the common areas. I mean, my gosh. I mean, that's that's the game. Look at how how the game has changed. I mean, just from a couple expansions from from World of Warcraft, we learned so much. We learned to do dungeons and dungeon wings. That way, we could reuse art assets over and over and get completely new dungeons. Uh, well, not maybe not completely new dungeons, but at least dungeon experiences. So you know. No worries. Well, you, you mentioned, and the, your fantastic quote from your book is that carrying on the theme of what you just said, you say game development is sustained improvisation, um, which which I completely hear where you're coming from. But going off on another little uh, sort of tangent from what you just said, you mentioned that there were never the, that many quests planned for uh, Vanilla originally, and obviously you guys right. um, tap danced on the spot and, and, and yeah. implemented many more. Along the same vein, and I know it's not necessarily your field, but whether or not you knew about the general 
um, thought process of the developers at the time. With itemization, you have touched on it um, very briefly in terms of there being, you know, the, the warning or the danger signs of being too much in the game. With itemization in vanilla, what was the thought process of putting in as many items as we did get? Because some people would argue that there's, you know, a, a boatload of items in vanilla, some of which might be, you know, somewhat useless in terms of how it's replaced pretty quickly afterwards or just not good in general. Um, in terms of the content that you were creating and the amount of items being placed on loot tables and things like that, what was the general ethos? Well, um, as far as items... Oh boy, the item designers, I'm trying to remember anything other than their pain <laughs> because <laughs> what they had, their process was actually, uh, uh, John Yu was our item designer and he had, he, I, he was one of my lunchtime uh, buddies. Okay. We would go do a lunch every day. And this is one of the quotes in the book where he would just complain the uh, the programmers would just change the formula for combat, and it would the the items would have to naturally reflect that change. Okay, and as you point out, there are many 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 items in the game, and every time it changed, he would have to go into the editor and change one item at a time. It wasn't done through a spreadsheet. You couldn't. Uh, import like I believe the character stats you can import those from a, a spreadsheet and that's one of uh, Alan Hadham's that was one of his uh, uh, big things that he would do he would sit there in front of a spreadsheet and he would just tweak this number and that number and one value and and but because the founder of the company wasn't an items designer <laughs> mm. the items designer did not get that luxury they got this very repetitive, clunky interface one at a time. And the formula changed every single day. So he was just tap dancing as fast as he could just to keep up with the changes so that the items wouldn't imbalance the whole game. Yes, there were many items. The items came from lots of sources. Uh, Eric Dodds's trade skills all had their items. Uh, mm -hmm. They all had different drop rates. I remember when we looked through uh, we were looking at something after the game was live and shipped. Eric couldn't even believe the low drop rates of some of his uh, trade skill uh, materials. He's like, oh, man, I've got to go through all of these dungeons again and, you know, bump up the uh, the drop rate on some things. But, uh, yeah, as far as items, we went through a number of ish, uh, philosophies. I mean, imagine – well, look at Diablo. Look, at, look, In fact, look at Diablo 3. How many times have they changed their items? You know, it's it's kind of like talents. It's kind of an unwinnable war. You, you're trying to satisfy one end of the spectrum where you're giving, where you're trying to give the the, the high end people a reason to to go through these painful uh, mythic experiences to get something that's a little bit better, but you have to rubber band all the guys that are kind of at the bottom that aren't able to invest that much time, you have to bring their items up to a point where those two groups can also play the same content meaningfully. So it's not trivial for one group or too hard for the other. So it's, it's a hard job. Mm. Um, it, yes. And they went through many types of thought uh, they redid the items many, many times. Were there too many? Probably. There's a whole bunch of legacy stuff in there that could be cut, and no one would uh, know. But it was it was a, also a matter of let's throw enough stuff at this. If it's not affecting frame rate, then it was okay to flood <laughs> the uh, the game with mm. too much of one thing or another. Frame rate was one of the bigger concerns, but um, yeah, too many items. Possibly, yeah, very okay. possibly, but not not the uh, hill you really need to die on. Mm. Now, getting back to uh, instances and some of the instances that you worked on, I'll, I'll, I'll begin with this sort of blanket question. Which instances did you particularly enjoy making? Oh, um, 
Uh, a broad answer to that is whatever instance I was currently working on, that's my favorite instance. Um, I would say, but looking back, my very favorite was Black Rock Depths. I'm, I'm more proud of that dungeon. It was reusing a texture set that had been done. Um, I think Upper Black Rock Spire was the first Black Rock dungeon that I built. Um, and it was okay. You know, it was <laughs> all right, you know. But at the time I was building it, I was uh, working. This was years before it was play tested, before we even had characters that were high enough to play test these uh, dungeons, we were working with the premise that you cannot have any combat near stairs or any ledge where a player could fall because mm. you could kite monsters. We didn't know what was going to stop exploiting from kiting, mon kiting monsters. Um, we didn't want players. We didn't know if a player disconnected, if they continued to run, if they were moving in one direction while they had a disconnect would they continue to run in that direction? So we didn't want to have any any shelves or grand vistas or anything like that we couldn't do. So that's kind of why Upper Black Rock Spire got was kind of ho-hum. It was it was supposed to end in Ren's uh, little arena. Hmm. And then I uh, got the go-ahead to build Lower Black Rock Spire and expand Upper Black Rock Spire. That's when I built that little bridge that goes over lower black rock spire and by that time we had tested combat we realized okay players aren't going to fall to their death that's not a really that's not a real concern okay so then i could build crazier stuff i could have lava pits below them and that's you know black rock depths was uh, uh lower i would say black rock depths and uh, lower black rock spire uh, my most proud of is Black Rock Mountain, the very hub. Um, you know that the chains and stuff, the statues. Uh, um, I'm very proud of that. Like I had a couple concept sketches for that. Uh, you usually don't get very good concept sketches for dungeons. It's hard to do a concept sketch for an interior space. You usually have to back away from something to really capture its essence. So if I were to t say pick, I was very proud of Black Rock Depths. I think there's some very beautiful, convincing city layouts in there. I like the layout of it. Uh, there's a nice flow. There's no big jumps, and there's some beautiful vistas in there. Um, that lower Black Rock Spire also, I liked the big amorphous shape that the uh, – that the uh, that the space inhabits and black rock mountain is my very, very favorite, uh, thing that I've done. Um, so that's, uh, those are my very, very favorite, uh, spaces. Uh, the, the slag pits are my favorite non instanced dungeons just because they were so ugly before I got a hold of them. They were using, uh, strangle thorn assets with, with thatched, uh, straw huts um it, yellow assets booty bay ass assets um it just looked inappropriate for the searing gorge mm. and so i just applied the dark iron dwarf textures made new buildings made new watchtowers we had orc watchtowers that you would see in duratar were out there and it just with the bright bleached wood it just looked very and it was just because we didn't have time to make assets. We couldn't officially put it on the schedule because the artists were burdened. Because I was working on weekends, I could actually ninja the stuff into the game. And, <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's basically how all of the micro dungeons got, you know, uh, put into the game is just all ninjing. Uh, there's a couple of us that they had sleep the through license. the cracks. Well, we had, uh, we had proved that we could finish our tasks while uh creating or improving other assets and there was myself on dungeons and roman kenny uh on creatures we would call them roman specials when he would take originally there each monster would have its own animation set and that was just how we were we were going to have about 80 different monsters and roman would come in and he would say well why don't we just build a new geometry, reuse an animation set, 
and call it a new monster. And he was able to do, to do that rapidly because it didn't have to be reanimated. And cause animation was like, like a big, uh, kind of a, a bottleneck at least on, on. So we would just say, Hey, Roman, can you do an animation? Can you make a crocodile do something with a crocodile, but make it, I don't know, a giant lizard or something like that. Mm. And he'd go, yeah, yeah. I, I think of the animations, you know, cause you could, you could go a little bit away from the, 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 uh, the source monster, but not too far. So, uh, yeah, so there's that was probably like the Searing Gorge was my favorite uh, non-instanced uh, okay. area. I'm glad you mentioned um, that you said that BRD w- was your favorite, and and you've just professed a lot of love for um, sort of the Black Rock Mountain general uh, area in general. And um, a listener had a very specific question about uh, these uh, two areas, and I'll just read these out to you one by one. So, firstly, sure. we'll get this one from listener Seismic Rend, who says this. Black Rock Depths is uniquely a massive interconnected dungeon with no set linear path. Can you take us through the design of it and the challenges that you encountered when creating it? Uh, now he mentioned, was he talking about Black Rock Depths? Is yes. Is that what he's, okay. Uh, yes. Um, <clears throat> For, for as a level designer, okay, there's a difference between a level designer and an environmental artist, okay? Level designer is the old school, first-person shooter. They're basically doing everything, okay? The environmental artist will usually start with the floor plan and the work with what is there. Uh, I like being a, a, a level designer because I'm used to massaging the elements myself. When I see two rooms that are next to each other, I punch a window there. And then you get that parallax of something off in the distance or, you know, it's, it's kind of cool. So that type of freedom is, I think, essential for really creating, uh, you know, a, a grand environment. Uh, one of the, one of the principles I embrace is believability. Uh, and this comes from Dungeons and Dragons. If you're building a dungeon, you don't put a room with a demon right next to, uh, you know, uh, a library that, uh, acolytes are using or it's, it's, you kind of want to have areas. And so Black Rock Depths, I wanted to have separate areas. You have the prison that kind of transitions to a gladiator arena and that there's a bridge over the city that goes to that gladiator arena. It's a kind of outside the city. I like the, the, the thing with the city gates. Um, it gets a little weird when you go from the city gate to the laboratory, you know, but that type of transition doesn't happen often. That's kind of what I go through. And, th- and then I design everything on uh, graph paper. Again, my Dungeons and Dragons roots. I do it on graph paper and I look at it to d- look at it straight down and say, okay, does this make sense? What opportunities can, can I move sections around and, and it's a lot easier to change things on graph paper than it is in a, you know, 3D space sometimes. Mm. So, uh, that's kind of how I do it. And then I look at it and say, okay, now how can we reuse these areas so that there's different paths going through there? And I kind of start with some paths and, I actually don't, we didn't know how linear or nonlinear our dungeons were going to be. Uh, we, that was one of the big questions that the game designers were not prepared to give us. And that's kind of sucky when you're working on an art asset that takes months to build and you have to find, oh no, it turns out linear is better or, or, oh no, it turns out nonlinear is better. So that was one of the things that, uh, Drove the uh, the dungeon crew crazy not having that information. As it turns out, it really didn't matter. You could do it either way. But uh, uh, the doorways that I put between these sections uh, were used by the quest designers. We got art assets that they could actually turn off, and you know they could actually control the traffic to some degree throughout the dungeon, depending on what quest you were on. So. Um, I, and I love all that. I love I love the nonlinear, uh, organic type of feeling of it. Uh, mm. 
but yeah, that's kind of why I like another reason why I like BRD. Okay. Now, the second part of that person's question was in regards to Upper Black Rock Spire. And right. they said this, and, and the reason I'm bringing up this question is this is actually one that came up a lot, um, which which I did not think of, that a lot of listeners were all over it, and they're all dying to know <laughs> okay. about this one. So oh, good. It, it starts with Upper Black Rock Spire, but you could apply it sort of generally. And they say this, in Upper Black Rock Spire, did you intend for groups to jump off the balcony into Ren's room? Are there any pathing shortcuts players would take that surprised you? So the follow on from that, the generic question was, and one of the more popular questions, um, one of the more upvoted questions that I got on Reddit when I put this out to the listeners was basically right. the same thing. What are some of the memorable ways that players ended up using your level design that you didn't expect, such as the BRD uh, lava yeah. run? Yep. Yep. Uh, there's a bunch of them around specifically, and it's probably because it's a high level dungeon and you know, players are trying to pick, take the path of least resistance, you know, the balcony jump just to get the balcony jump, just to get into upper black rock spire was completely unplanned for completely. Mm. Like if you're in black rock mountain and you run behind the statue, you know, that was, I, I originally wanted to run up the stairs and then those, those damn, uh, uh, designers put a bunch of, uh, mobs out there, plus mobs <laughs> that were, when they hit you, they have a slow. So it actually makes it hard for you to run away from them. I mean, just <laughs> how brutal did they really need to make that stuff? And luckily, you know, Jeff Kaplan was, he, he was doing high enough level content that he sympathized in. He even came to say, Hey, John, make this jump easier. The torrents have a hard time because they have a higher, uh, uh, hit box than other, like their collision box is bigger. So it's harder for a torrent <laughs> to actually make this jump, which originally was never intended. So I moved the, the ledge closer to that little balcony in Black Rock Mountain. So you could go straight into the instance. Hmm. Another in the same area was during the alpha. I talk about this in uh, the, at the end of my book. Uh, Alex Afrasabi uh, mm -hmm. was our high-end raider. He was Fuhrer from uh, EverQuest in yep. the Fires of Heaven Guild. And, and of course, it's late at night. It's like 1130 at night. He just shows up in my doorway. And this is at the tail end of the project. Everyone's burned out. He has this crazy look in his eyes. He's like, John, <laughs> okay, I got a request. Okay. I was... And he'd, he'd, he would check himself and he would wait. And he's like, I was cursing your name a little bit, but I'm okay now. Uh, do you think you could do this for me? Okay. And this was during an art lockdown where I'm not allowed to change anything that hasn't been checked out. Uh, he wanted me to allow players to, who fall into the lava to get onto to climb up out of the lava in Black Rock Mountain hmm. uh, onto the shore to go into they, he was he was raiding for the molten core mm -hmm. and while he was running down the chains there was this little bump of collision that he was the only Torin in his in his his guild mm -hmm. he had forty people in his guild they would all run down when they'd have a wipe and he, he his shoulder would bump against this <laughs> chain and it would knock him into the lava okay <laughs> and of course this is happening happening after a a, a, a wipe hmm. so they're doing the, this as ghosts hmm. and as a ghost you can't get out of the lava cuz you know normally they could summon you they'd have a chance of summoning you hmm. if you were living but as a ghost he would have to release at the graveyard take a huge hit in his uh uh armor his um repair bills uh, yeah yeah durability and then he'd have to run make that super long run across searing gorge and he'd forget about the chain again, and we'd go back into the <laughs> lava. Okay, and let me tell you, this is this is a guild leader. So it's and he's kind of yeah. I mean, you have to be kind of like the authoritarian type of, type of dictator to 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 be a high end raiding guild as Fires of Heaven was at the time. And 
it was really embarrassing for him to do this after a wipe when he's yelling at people who aren't performing well. And for him to be out of, he has to go to Duratar or no, uh, Cargath repair, then go back. He'd forget about that collision one by the time and he'd go right back. So yeah, that was another change that, and I did that. We, that was a ninja change. That was probably the, and I, and I, I think it was the last art change before the, uh, the disc went gold because it was completely unapproved by the, uh, producers. No one but Alex and I knew about it at the time. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, some other changes to geometry, the drop down, um, uh, in Blackrock, in lower Blackrock Spire, uh, where you can skip a lot. It turned out to be a, too long of a crawl to do from the beginning. If you go into the instance of lower black rock spire, you turn right. I added some ledges where people could like shimmy across, uh, across the ledges and drop down halfway through the, uh, the, the dungeon so that they could, uh, finish the end content. Um, and this is when our dungeons were just way too long. <laughs> All right. Well, you mentioned the keywords that a lot of people want to hear about, and this is definitely the something that I want to hear about, and that was Molten right. Core. And sure. the reason – I really must preface this, uh, uh, John. You'll actually laugh at this, and my listeners know this about me. Um, yeah. Even though I spend all this time doing this World of Warcraft podcast and I spend you know hours a week talking about the game, you'll be shocked to learn that I never rated. So <laughs> my experience well, – not shocked at all. Not shocked at all. I I know, I know. So my experience of all of your beautifully designed raids has been by way of YouTube. So I must apologize for that. But <laughs> that's quite all right. What, what the listeners are dying to know, and 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 they want to know about the design of Molten Core. But what I'm dying to know is, let's talk about what is now the kind of infamous Molten Core week. Everyone knows that, and we, we've all seen, you know, the, the LFG documentary about the making of World of Warcraft, where it's sort of casually dropped that Molten Core was designed in a week. Can you explain yeah. that week at Irvine? Yes, I can. Um, uh, because I was one of the people who had free license to ninja things in the game without... Uh, uh, drawing the uh, uh, the ire of the producers who were the watchmen for the uh, the schedules, uh, people came to me to ninja stuff into the game. <laughs> okay, so I was ninjaing things into the game for other people, and Jeff Kaplan learned that a long time ago. <laughs> and I did, I did many things because I was also a sympathetic rater. It's funny. At one point I was the highest end, I was the highest end uh, rating person on the, the development team. Um, okay. And so I was sympathetic to that. Um, yeah. M Molten core was Jeff showed up at my office and said, John, come here. <laughs> and you know there's no reason for him to say in a quiet voice so i'm like okay all right this is gonna be good you know and he shows me that here as much as we like the uh anixia's lair we really need we need a raid uh area and that's where he used scott mercer from team one who ninjaed in all the fights he borrowed me i built the dungeon when I say built the dungeon in a week, it, I, I actually did it in a day. It took a day to actually lay it out. Wow. And it's the simplest. By this time, I'd done so many caves. And the fact that there weren't any stalactites in it, I was really able to uh, <laughs> uh, build this fast. Because, frankly, I had the safety net of the red fog that made it epic and cool no matter what. The geometry is so bland and boring, it took no time to do. I'm almost embarrassed by how primitive the geometry is. Uh, the, the only design change that he made uh, is originally going to be a ring. And when I, when I built the ring, that was just me. There was no meetings. There was no nothing. He says, John, we just need like lava and we need uh, uh, this type of feel and that'll be epic enough. Just make a dungeon. I'm like, okay. So I came up with the idea and I'd seen Ragnaros. Uh, Brandon Idol had done Ragnaros, uh, really cool item. So I, he was circular, 
uh, and he was round. So I'm like, okay, I'll do a round dungeon. <laughs> okay. And mm-hmm. that's the thought that I put into it. I did a ring. Originally, the, the there's uh, your listeners will know they're the, the hounds, the lava dogs. Yep. Yep. They were connected to an area of Golamag by a little tiny little connection point and Jeff's only request. And he's so sheepish when he acts, when, when he makes these requests, it's kind of cute. It's kind of sweet. Cause I don't care about the, you know, at that area. He says, can you get rid of this one little area? That's the only thing I'm like, Oh yeah, sure. That's not baby. Hmm. You know, and five minutes later it's gone, you know, hmm. and I've already forgotten about it, but you know, he tiptoes around it so much that it's kind of funny, but, that was a change, and I punched up uh, Ragnaros's lair. It was originally – it's still a spiral, but I think I, it, it's more irregular than it originally was. Um, but, yeah, that was just really quickly done, and it's also – and you'll find this funny. It's the only dungeon I ever get compliments on. It's the, oh. Oh, I, could t- I could list the only one. all the dungeons. The only one that I ever hear compliments. I, I have heard, um, oh, what's the werewolf dungeon? Uh, Shadowfang Cave. Silverfang. Shadowfang. Aaron was my office mate. Aaron has heard that once you get onto the parapets, that's kind of cool. Yeah, okay? everyone loves but, that. Yeah. And believe me, that was a big fight to get that to, to happen. Really? To duplicate. Oh, yeah. To because when when you're on an instance, it's on a completely different server tab. That's of not course. connected to the real world. Hmm. So you're copying and pasting the exterior, and those tools really didn't exist until we enlarged Strangle uh, Thorn. So we couldn't do that at one point. But when we had those tools, then we like, oh well, we can copy and paste the real world, and it will just make a big facade and. No one had ever thought about that. And we're like, hmm. okay, yeah, well, I guess we can do that. And, uh, but he got compliments on that. I've only gotten compliments of molten core. It's because of the fog. It's not the geometry, certainly, or the design of the, uh, although the Baron fight actually takes, takes advantage of the geometry. Um, uh, it was just the fog. That's the, like in my entire four years of crunching wow. on wow that's the compliment oh i love the red fog it is so cool oh but you know gosh. i've played it enough myself that i also think it is cool it's just it's a really cool atmosphere well let me tell you that all i do for the show is i just trawl through forums for comments from players of the game and that even though you might not have been told personally there is a lot of love <laughs> for molten core and, and and i think people appreciate you know the reasons why it is a little bit um lacking in in flair and flavor in terms of the time in which it was built and yes you say the geography is a little bit drab in places but people love that instance and the way in oh, which yeah. uh, it works and the way in which you navigate oh, that I know. area. Yeah, so oh, yeah, they love them. Or, believe yeah. me, let me let me pass on some thanks for the community to you for that. But uh, a funny thing you mentioned when you talk about Shadowfang uh, Keep and and the way in which it was designed when you hit the parapets, I, I, it comes to mind that scene in the Truman Show when he's on the boat and essentially he's got the painted background and he exactly. finally hits the wall. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Flowing on from that, um, you mentioned that I, I find it quite funny that you don't get sort of um, much feedback of of love for your work outside of Molten Core, but um, the next thing that I wanted to talk about, and, and was well, something you mentioned much, much earlier, was that um, you, or, I mean, obviously you've worked on pretty much, uh, you know, a vast number of the instances in the game, but you said that uh, the Temple of Ankaraj was the first one that you worked on, like the actual first one you did some work on, is that right? Yeah, first and worst. But, well, first and worst, what makes you say that? Oh, oh let me tell you. Okay, so this was my transition from a BSP editor. I'd never used 3DS Max. And I didn't have anyone on the team to really show me how to use this tool, which is really, really flexible. I mean, you could work in 3D Studio Max. We had guys on Team 1 who had used that tool for Warcraft 3 and didn't know that textures could tile that they could repeat like a tile pattern. They didn't know that that was even an option. These were the veterans of Blizzard. So it's a big tool. And these are, you know, obviously senior artists. So 
to figure out how to use that tool for dungeons, there's a lot of pain. And I created a bunch of geometry. I, I modeled in the actual ripples and you can't see it really on the textures. Uh, poor Jimmy. Jimmy Glow was the texture artist. And what he did is I made so much detail. It was like kind of like an accordion. Like the, mm -hmm. the texture that you get on an accordion, all those little ripples in the uh, walls. And I was, I didn't know what the lighting was going to be in our game. Um, we have more like vector based lighting. So you don't actually pick up any of those details. So Jimmy is painting textures. Jimmy loves painting textures that are so saturated with color to, to overcome this geometry that i put on that none of the lights actually affect the textures you know like a if you have a white texture or a pale texture it really takes uh, you can put lights and you get a green area a red area or a blue area you can really play around with different areas without changing the texture set and colored lighting never affected his textures and it just got ugly and it was the first dungeon and we were always faced do we want to start over with this dungeon or do we want to just live with it as is and just try to tweak it and i made lots and lots of changes to it we didn't know how big a raid group was going to be and the play spaces are too narrow really for a lot of raiding it was too long I didn't know how long a rating experience was going to be. Um, and that coupled with me learning 3D Studio Max, uh, the dungeon, <laughs> the dungeon, what I borrowed from uh, Riven was a game that had this building that was a globe and it had this slice cutting through this big golden globe. Mm. It was just the coolest thing. And I wanted to steal that and put it on mine. And from the top down, I, I did a slice uh, through it, through the hemisphere, and then another slice so that it was like a T. And from the top down, it looked like a scarab. And I wanted to have like this Egyptian flair with not being overtly Egyptian. And so it was kind of like an old god uh, flavor where the the building itself was a giant scarab. But... You never saw the building from any distance. I didn't know what the draw distance was for the players. So you never saw it from afar. You never saw these slices through the, the building. They, they were just weird. Um, and it's because I'm building blind. You know, I don't know how the camera works. That's a huge, huge deal. I don't know how far back the camera goes. I don't know if it's chase cam and I, camera. I was pretty sure it wasn't the first person shooter camera. Although that option was, you know, in the game, but, uh, oh uh, yeah, just a pain in the ass the whole way. <laughs> Understood. Now you just mentioned something that I, I really quickly want to touch on because you talked about, um, the inspiration from Riven and also, you know, a bit of a uh, Egyptian flavor, obviously with the uh, temple of AQ and, um, a listener Minoru asked the following question where he says, I hear it's common when designing areas and dungeons during game development to cross reference areas from the real world. What are some places that you worked on that took inspiration from real life so and have you had the chance to visit those areas of the world and catch a glimpse of the world of warcraft in real life so outside of the examples that we've heard um were there any real life inspiration for the dungeons that you designed um yes absolutely well i've already said the whaling caverns mm -hmm. um i recalled another family vacation we, we we went to virginia uh virginia beach uh there was a uh a civil war earthworks uh, they had, it, it never occurred to me to use very steep fortifications made and it's grass and it's to repel obviously cannonballs, but the idea of a tiered type of, uh, mound earthworks is, is, was interesting to me. And that dovetailed into how I built, uh, a lot of the razor fin dungeons okay. where you had kind of tears like the, like the central spiral of a razor fin downs was kind of like that. And these are very, very loose connections. Um, another va family vacation, I was in Sudbury, Canada, 
and the, it was kind of like a very, very rocky area. Uh, glaciers had scooped up a lot of the earth and there's deposits of lots and lots of rocks. And these rocks were discolored from acid rain. And I was young enough at the time where I uh, made the wrong association that a meteorite had uh, impacted the the ground in Sud Sudbury and deposited a lot of nickel there. There's a nickel mine that we went to. And now I thought that the meteor had scorched the the rocks and that that's why they were all black. Mm. It was the weirdest thing. You'd have this. Uh, you know, brown dirt, brown everything, but the rocks were themselves. You could see that there was like almost like a uh, a finish, a black finish on them. And I thought that, ooh, you know, I was a little kid. It was kind of cool that a meteorite burnt all the rocks. <laughs> <laughs> and that's kind of, I, I told that story to Bill Petrus, uh, who was our art director. He would always come to me for like uh, ideas for zones. Like Metzen would, he would do his like war zones and then he'd say, hey, just rock and roll with whatever for, for the rest of the zones. And so, Bill, we would try to hit every trope. Uh, I came up with a genre from uh, the tidal pools, um, but the blast of lands, we, he didn't like the idea of black used. Black was kind of like a no, no or very, very seldom used in the game. Mm. Uh, but he said that kind of worked with the dark portal. They were recently moving the dark portal over from, uh, uh another zone. Um, I think it was in the world tree, uh, area into the uh, blasted lands. Cause there wasn't really anything cool going on in the mm. blasted lands. And you could argue that there still isn't anything cool going on <laughs> in the blasted lands. So, uh, um, but yeah, that was a real world influence. Um, I seem to think every time I drove by Blizzard, there's a, a bunch of, uh, and I'm pronouncing this wrong, a jacunda tree. Uh, they're this tree with purple flowers. And I think the zone is Teldrassil. I never played a night elf. So um, it was the purple trees. I thought influenced our tree guy, Justin mm. uh, Taverat. Uh and I bugged it like those, those were your influence. Weren't they? Weren't they? Cause right outside our campus, right outside our campus were all, like this row of purple trees. And they were so beautiful at one time of the year where they jacaranda they were, trees uh, is what you were thinking of jacaranda trees. There you go. And when the, the leaves would fall, they, they were just, it was so beautiful. And I just, I kind of, I kind of like twisted Justin's arm to admit that, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's where he got that idea. But I don't know if that's where he got that idea to, to do the purple trees, but let's go with that story. Um, All right. Yeah. Now, just uh, getting back to something that you mentioned about Molten Core, and, and I found it interesting that you said um, you were told what, what Ragnaros was going to be, um, and, and you designed sort of the circle-shaped instance around this circle form yeah. that you thought yeah. you were getting. Now, listener young Liam asked the following question. I'd love to know, when building a raid instance, is the layout designed with a general idea of where bosses are going to be and who they are beforehand? Or do they get designed later and placed accordingly once the raid's layout has been set? Which side of the development comes first, or does it just happen simultaneously? Um, that's a really good question. Um, I, in the old school, uh, we didn't have our act together to actually have a plan where, you know, it was, what are you free on? What are you free to work on? You know? Okay. Well, we need this dungeon. Okay. Uh, let's throw a lore meeting together with Metzen. So we can get you working on this game designers would have no idea who's even actually working on the dungeon. Okay. Uh, a lot often they'll have a lore uh, meeting and that's when the game designers get involved and they'll say yeah we want about three bosses and then a final boss or two bosses and the final boss now it's very very orchestrated um i don't want to speak too much uh because it's been gosh seven years mm -hmm. since i've been mm -hmm. uh actually eight years since i've been on the wow team um so but like when i left it, it was they knew exactly what was going in but I think a lot of the uh, – I actually like the old style because that's what I was uh, used to. 
uh, where the geometry of the dungeon would actually inspire the uh, game designers. It'd force them out of their comfort zone and look at the geometry and say, oh, okay, how can I use this room? There's a lot of cool stuff to, to work with. That's kind of how I prefer. A lot of the other level designers wanted a blueprint to work from. Um, and I was kind of a blueprint guy anyway. So I wanted a blank piece of paper. Then I'd build the blueprint. Then I'd build the dungeon. So it was kind of like both ways. I think for Vanilla WoW, it was almost exclusively the dungeon would be uh, designed first. We would have a number of bosses because we'd have a, just an idea of how long, how much work, how many uh, monsters we could put. That's one of the basic, that's really the telling factor. That was the variable that decided how many bosses you could do is how many monsters could we size up and then call it a boss? You know, hmm. we, 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 we said, well, like the Murloc showed up in the Wailing Caverns, you know, hmm. uh, there was, there was just bosses that we'd have a monster model say, well, we haven't really scaled that one up and used it as a boss. We'll put that one in there. And if it didn't go with the dungeon, then we wouldn't do that. And we'd try to bite the bullet and either use the same model and do a Roman special and retexture it and reanimate it and call it a, its unique thing. But, uh, it was a mix of that, but it's actually the monster models uh, kind of limited us to the Molten Core. We had a whole bunch of things that no one had ever seen before. So they went crazy and there's like, oh my gosh, like nine bosses or something ridiculous in that dungeon. Um, maybe not that many, but uh, yeah, so it was just, we were just rock and rolling. There was a lot of uh, improvisation, but uh uh, it was, we'd look and see what assets were available and that's kind of, and whether or not that fit into the content load that we were targeting, whether okay. it's a, you know, an Uber dungeon, but yeah. Which, now this is a question of mine, which dungeon was the most difficult to design or which dungeon did you get? the most pushback, if any, from management on and why? Um, it was usually, well, probably on Karash just because it wasn't as malleable. I didn't build it correctly. And so I couldn't actually improvise or make changes or make corrections. Uh, I've had direction from the game designers to make it longer. And then when I made it longer, they, they asked to make it shorter. <laughs> and, you know, when there's like eight months between these requests, there's a lot of time that goes into some of that. Well, I, mm. not, I'm not saying it took eight months to build these sections, but sometimes you j just mentally want to say, okay, that's done. I don't have to revisit that stuff again. Uh, but there's a lot of pushback. Uh, it's, you're trying to make everybody happy. It's never a management decision where, uh, they laid the hammer down. Um, I was probably more bull, bullheaded, uh, with Ankarash because I was sick of, I must have revisited that thing about seven times. Uh, none of which I had ideas to do with because it, it takes a large texture set to really make a dungeon sing like, the Black Rock Dungeons sing because Brian Morris wrote our texture artist. He gave me like 60 textures, you know, which was gorgeous. I had, I think I had like maybe 20 for Ankarash and 10 of those were just for the temple itself. So when I have only 10 textures to do all the hive tunnel network, it it's hard to make rooms feel different than other rooms. So, the hardest one I would probably say is on Karash. They all had their different problems. Uh, uh, one of my, I'm doing a promotion article. Uh, your listeners will appreciate this. I left it out of my book because I didn't think it belonged in my book. It wasn't about John stats, John stats, John stats. I wanted to push the narrative of how it was a team moving forward. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, it's, it's kind of retraining my thinking, uh, I really don't like promoting myself. Uh, the blizzard, the old blizzard uh, school of thought was um, don't take credit for what you work on so that everyone can take credit for the game. 
And that's unless QA. it was the PR guy, right? Uh, no. Oh, yeah. We wanted the PR guy to <laughs> exactly. take all the credit. Yeah, Bill. <laughs> Bill Roper was. Uh, yeah, and some fans just had the idea that he did. He did everything himself, and that was <laughs> fine with us because it was just so funny because he wasn't a dev at all. He had started out, you know, as a producer. I think. Well, he he was there before me. I don't want to speak on his uh on his turn, but uh, when I was there, he was just the PR guy, hmm. and uh, it was just uh, so. I didn't want my book to be about me, so I left out a lot of the information for my dungeon. So I'm going to have a promotion, promotional article, I think, in a few weeks. Uh, it'll show up on Wowhead, uh, and it lists all of my dungeons and the liner notes of each dungeon. So you can kind of see the inspiration and my thought process behind mm. them. So you, you come across as a very you know humble man in the excerpt that I read, and you do mention that a few times in that the Blizzard ethos was you know you don't put yourself first; it's about the team and all of that jazz, which I think is a, a fantastic corporate structure, obviously. But um, you know that's that's the only reason I'm getting so in depth on your work here is is people obviously whilst we appreciate that um, you you don't want to shout from the hilltops about your achievements, I right. would have no dramas coming forward saying they certainly are achievements. That, that should be celebrated and that's why we love to dig deeper on them but um something that uh comes up in terms of w w when we do focus on your work in particular um i've got another listener question from a listener named Sveja, and they say the following if you john could have changed an aspect of the vanilla level design with the knowledge of the game's launch and the full life cycle that we have now what would you change the raiding counter team clearly started to hit their stride with instances like aq zg and nax if you were part of the right. classic wow team again and you got to essentially have a do-over would you want the mechanics in earlier raids and dungeon instances to be polished and returns to a similar level of complexity uh, to encounters later in the history of WoW. So basically, would you change anything? Well, that's an interesting question. Uh, I, some of my favorite encounters are from the Molten Core. Um, I think some of the fights have so much personality. The Baron Geddon, I think, is still my... Uh, the, uh, the living bomb mechanic is just so much fun that once it becomes mitigated by your uh, uh, fire resistance, it, it becomes a, a, a trick where if you have the bomb, you try to run over to the guild leader and, and kill him <laughs> with this, this, this debuff that explodes and kills every one around you. It's uh it's, it's, I guess everything evolves. Um, I thought the, the death wing was, Really, I, I rated pretty much in all the raids, mm -hmm. uh, up through, I think, uh, Ice Crown Citadel was my last, uh, raid. Um, uh, the last raid that I was, that I built, I, I, I tag team Nax Ramus with, uh, Dana Jan, but that was in, uh, Wrath of the Lich King. That was a later, uh, a raid. But, um, what I would change is, I think I would change, and this is funny. This is really funny. I would change the salary of the level <laughs> designers, not because of me and not because of me. OK, it's okay. because it was impossible to hire level designers. Yes. I think what we got, we had environmental artists, very good environmental artists, but they didn't care about gameplay. Uh, it was like twisting their arm to get gameplay and they kind of wanted to follow blueprints and which is ironic because that's kind of how uh i think i think the wow team is built now where it's split between two different disciplines you have designers building the blueprint and then but that's just me i was the really only level designer like on the the, the vanilla team shouting hey guys let's go this way while the other guys were like, uh, you know, uh, we're comfortable over here. So, and it's because if you have a higher salary, you could actually get it. We couldn't hire any experience. That's maybe why I got the job in the first place is Blizzard couldn't hire anybody who was, um, I mean, uh, this was 2000. I was making $50,000. That was my, uh, 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 starting salary. 
and they were comparing that to the level designers for Warcraft 3 and StarCraft, which is a complete misnomer because those uh, roles are all scripting and they're doing drop and drag placement of art assets. Completely different from someone starting in 3D space and meshing out uh, polygons and applying textures in a really complicated uh, uh, art heavy environment of 3d studio max so i would probably get i would lean toward more level designers to uh uh to 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 you know really embrace uh the gameplay so as far as like the boss fights and stuff goes i i kind of like the earlier <laughs> I, I i well death wing was boy that was just a brutal um that was just a brutal instance. Uh, there's some really tough fights in that instance. Uh, yes, um, the Stranglethorn, and I forget the is it Zolgarub? I want to. I can't remember mm. the, the the Stranglethorn. Um, I love the outdoor flavor of that. Um, a lot of those fights happened because there were more tools available to the designers. Hmm. There were more features available to the designers. Jeff Kaplan joked that all their boss fights in the Molten Core uh, used knockback, which was this fake – it was a parabolic spline that it would project players on and would uh, mimic – the 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 idea of physics where you're flying through the air our game doesn't have any physics there's fo- there's there's a pull down there's there's kind of phony gravity but there's no inertia or anything so uh jeff had to beg on his hands and knees for knockback to be given as a feature and that feature is every single boss fight <laughs> of the game. So, and even though it was like a day or two of coding, it was a very simple thing. That's how precious, pre- precious programming time was on the team to be able to uh, uh, get a new feature like that in the game. So it's kind of hard to, I, I, I kind of like the old fights. I don't know. The classic WoW is going to be hard to make. Hmm. I think it's going to be way harder. Uh, I question the the uh, the level of passion on the developers because if you're a developer, you, the job title speaks. You want to develop. You don't want to follow in somebody's footsteps. Hmm. So it's kind of a disingenuous uh, approach toward building something when you've got all these creatives that are coloring inside the lines. I'm going to be very, very interested to uh, see, but I'll tell you what, Blizzard, uh, they're not, they're not dumb. They're not, they're not going to release something that doesn't work or something that doesn't have a long term plan. Uh, I think they're going to figure it out though. Hmm. And just to to travel down that tangent just a little bit now, because it was something um, I was going to finish up on, but more than happy to sort of cover off now that it's come up. You mentioned that, well, you mentioned the Deathwing encounter a few times, and I presume you also said that you, it's been about eight years since you were with Blizzard. So I presume the Cataclysm was the last expansion that you worked on. Is that right? Correct. Okay. So taking that information into account, um, appreciating that you were with Blizzard for quite a while, but you've been gone for eight years, were yeah. you? What was your reaction to the announcement of the Classic Project? And also, do you have any other thoughts on the the kind of work that might go into it, or what uh, the the trials and tribulations the development team might go through in terms of bringing that to us? Um, I have some inside information i'm not going to uh say okay um and i don't even know if it's even accurate well That's can i can I, can I just can i just feign uh, for a second for my listeners uh no john please tell us please no, please it's, uh, it's it's let me tell you i'm <laughs> not uh, i'm not a spokesperson for blizzard you know i i probably wouldn't even recognize the process at this time. And I think it would be disrespectful to the people who are putting that project together to really uh, speculate too much, but a hundred percent. No, I'm with you. I'm, redoing... I'm, I'm, I'm ble- being playful. Obviously I appreciate that. There's no, no, stuff no, no. Oh disclose. no, no. I'm uh, no, it's you have free license to, because <laughs> uh, you know, I, I don't want to, 
no one's going to mistake you for a spokesperson for Blizzard. Mm. Okay. And there's a very real danger in me releasing this book, which the only reason why I'm writing it is because I'm leaving computer game development. Okay. I'm not going to use this. I'm not going to parlay this into raising my profile so that I get a lead position on a new project or anything like that. There's no danger of that at all. I'm not. And in, I'm kind of glad that I'm doing this while I'm leaving, hmm. you know, uh, computer game development, uh, cause I feel more comfortable to it. Yep. The first 15 pages of the book, you can hear my angst hmm. at not giving credit where credit is due. And the book is kind of bogged down with a lot of names, but that was not something that I was going to back off. I wanted to name people who had actually, you know, built the trees or built the common stuff, you know, Dan Moore built more props than anyone he's been on the team longer than anyone else but you you don't you know it's that type of workhorse that you need on the team uh to make the project you know sing mm -hmm. you know he built the brooms you know someone's got to do the stools someone's got to do the tables and of course he moved up to you know the the more exotic weapons and stuff like that but there's a lot of uh there's a lot of stuff there's a lot of assets and, and passion that goes into uh jobs that aren't high profile and i i left my dungeons out of the book because i didn't want to come across as the only person who actually uh worked on the dungeons the dungeons are filled with art assets that other artists do mm -hmm. and they're texture artists and the lore guys you know i don't want this to be john stats's dungeon you know mm -hmm. uh so when I'm writing my own book, I get to spend as much text as I need to spend to make sure that everybody gets their credit. Right. And, uh, you know, if it bogs down the narrative, tough. And I don't, and I don't think it does. I think it's actually interesting and telling when I do actually name the people who worked on, uh, because that's educational to people. I think people don't realize how big development teams are. Um, they have hundreds of people on World of Warcraft now. So, uh, and going back to your original question, yeah, it's, I think there's going to be a lot of tough, uh, uh, tough spots. There's going to be some painful, painful things that people just aren't going to do. And it's, it, it's a weird balancing act, giving, uh, respect to what was been built before, but frankly, you know, you're a developer, you know, you should make it your own, you know, uh, they're, they're, it's, it's going to be weird. I actually, I don't know how they're going to do it, but I think it's not going to be easy. I know that I can guarantee you that it's going to be a lot harder, uh, especially on the code and data side. I don't know how, you know, I don't know how that gets changed it's it's so when, when when something is fixed a bug is fixed how does that bug you know if that bug's been in the game for eight months and you make the cutoff at this point you know how do you track thousands and thousands of code bugs design bugs and art bugs it's it's weird <laughs> mm -hmm. so yeah i don't know if that helps uh no, no, I, I, on the I got issue it. Or, or not, but uh, I see a lot of people very cavalier. They're, they're, they talk in a very casual, oh, this should be, you know, just turn on the money faucet. And this is so not that case. This might be as hard as making uh, vanilla wow. I mean, it might be that hard because you have to have people who are passionate about the project or you're going to end up with something soulless. So, and that will show in playtesting internally. They'll know whether or not they got something that's working, that's has its own voice where it's singing on its own. Um, they'll know that internal playtesting. So it's probably, you, you're going to, you're going to be on here. You're going to be counting down to classic, I think for quite a while. Okay. Well, no, that's, that's fine. I've got a lot to get through, but it's interesting with that, the inside, the slight inside information that you say you might have. We need to do like a, a charades game where you go, all right, five words sounds like, and then maybe we'll get it out of you that way one it's, day. It's actually very general, uh, through the, the, the grapevine. It's probably, you know, 
who knows it's if even if it's even been resolved by now so mm. yeah all good. I'll let Blizzard talk about it. Yeah, all good, all good. Well, it's interesting that you say through your experience that you still think it is quite a way away because obviously the release date is something that is the greatest point of speculation at this point. So if I had to pin you down, uh, through your experiences with Blizzard and, and knowing what might come with an, uh, a project like Classic, if I had to give you a closest to the pin guess, what month and year would you guess that we're getting Classic? Wow, what month? Forget about month. Okay. It's only going to be a question of years. Mm. Plural. Mm-hmm. Plural. Um, so you're thinking 2020 and beyond? Uh, I would eat my hat if they got it done before 2020. Wow. Yeah. Part of I, me I, just I, died inside, John. <laughs> well, that's. you have to understand, I haven't been in Blizzard's doors since, oh, geez, you know, seven years yep. so i'm really outside the loop uh yeah i mean what's what's funny is like i don't even play computer games anymore so because i have a problem with my hands uh so i'm in i'm in the board game space now. Right. i could talk, talk to you about board games but uh yeah that's my speculation and i know how obsessive blizzard is with their uh, it depends on how much they want to uh scale this up i saw a very interesting video of somebody uh speculating what do you do how many times do you do raids on the molten core i mean is this is are these servers going to be up for one year or five years do you really raid the molten core and anixia that many times over five years i mean what do you do do you go to the next expansion um it's gonna it's gonna be a solution that probably nobody ever thought of. It's gonna be uh probably a mix of things, kinda like robbing Peter to pay Paul. You know, that the the guys on the far end of the spectrum, the absolutists are not going to be happy with it. But it's going to be a pro- product that is probably going to appeal. For me, vanilla wow or classic wow for me is it means slower progression through leveling and that's kind of what i because the game got pretty fast pretty easy uh in uh what's let's see uh ice crown um uh wrath of the lich king I, it was just the leveling leveling i think has more weight on it but that's just me i'm just like one voice i mean uh wow is everything to everyone you mm. know and they're gonna they're gonna try to uh try to please everybody <laughs> but I, who knows who knows they might have some quick fix that they can figure out how to you know repeat content very quickly mm-hmm. and i might be wrong but uh let's see what are we halfway through 2018 that's mm-hmm. a year and a half through 2020 Mm-hmm. I'll eat my hat if they do it before 2020. All right, all right. I tell you, we will have to make a friendly bet because I'm saying half. <laughs> I'm saying halfway through next year. I, I, summer 2019 is my uh, current guess. It does change every now and again, but maybe so. Maybe we'll, we'll, so. We'll have to make a bet on that one. It's now, gonna. It's gonna take a long time just to staff up for that. Mm. Oh yeah, absolutely. I've got I no mean, no. There's doubt. gonna be po- people are not gonna be wanting to go to, you know, walking into somebody else's. Uh, walking along somebody else's footsteps if you're a creative person you're going to want to you know jam on your own games new new ip new products blizzard's always got more products going on than uh are commonly known um Hmm. now one thing you mentioned john you said the absolutists aren't uh, going to be happy with what they get in classic uh what do you mean by that are you referring to like the purists what would you extrapolate on that point well for someone who Okay, for somebody who says there's no consensus of which patch was Classic WoW, you know, there's Mm -hmm. no clear consensus. Um, If there was like in that, that's pretty much what I mean. Everyone has a different idea, I think, from what I've read of what Classic WoW is. Now, uh, the servers that we're on mm, probably have proved me wrong, you know. Um, but uh, I don't know. 
I just, uh, I think Cataclysm was a change um, that, honestly, rolling back some of the uh, the lava zones in Cataclysm might make, you know, a lot of people happy. Mm. Um, I don't know, really, I, I don't know if the appeal is going to be as broad-based as everyone speculates by just going to a specific patch, okay? Um, and Blizzard will know that. And they're smart enough to make a product that is going to play. They, they want the casual player, okay? Mm, often, but they're no also doubt. keeping in mind the, the – the, well, the casual player pays the bills, yeah. okay? You know, I mean, that, that's, that's not even a question. It's mm-hmm. not even a Blizzard uh, uh, idiom. You know, it's, it's not one of their maxims. That's just what they have to do to pay the bills, okay? Um, so – to justify that project, they have to make a good game. And you cannot just go to a single patch because really, I just can't imagine playing that patch for three years, you know, mm. or, or, you know, if you're going to do an MMO, you better do something that's going to last a lot longer than three years. MMOs are really tough to make. They're really tough to make. Um, yeah, no one on the WoW team wanted to make another MMO by the end of the project. Not a single person. And everyone who went to another MMO, <laughs> they, I'm sure they all regretted it. I know I did. But, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's just a tough, uh, tough gig. So mm-hmm. just show a lot of patience with, with the developers. They're definitely, you know, I mean, they, these are guys that have definitely earned everybody's uh, trust. Uh, I think they're going to do... Mm-hmm do it right knowing what you know about blizzard and the way in which they conduct their business and develop games you've just mentioned a few times that you know people don't want to be stuck in the same patch for years on end and one of the greatest uh, points of contention now with regards to the classic community is whether or not even though we haven't got you know classic yet we always like to speculate what's even further down the road whether or not blizzard would consider if classic you know were to do well or even if it didn't a patch 1.13 and create new content for the classic project do you think that's something they would consider doing oh absolutely absolutely i mean if they're going to make a classic wow it's going to be fundamentally different from standard wow like wow is today i i fundamentally in that it's probably going to be a little bit more hardcore it's going to be slower leveling uh they're going to be probably taking a lot of uh uh boy you know some of the expansions they were taking the world out of world of warcraft they were a lot of there's too many conveniences so that you know sometimes you have to slow people down even though it is downtime that's when you're chatting and it's the chatting that makes a guild stick together you know where if you're if you're so focused on a goal then you know it's not as social um but this is, you know, these debates will go on <laughs> forever, not just with World of Warcraft. You know, any game is going to uh, uh, be facing this. But, uh, yeah, it, and if it's fundamentally from, like, the, what WoW is today, um, it'll be probably trivial to create new content. That, that, that's the thing. Uh, if that's the way they go, okay? Um, but new content needs new rewards, and new rewards means you have to be at a higher level. There's no point in just like, like you can't put all of the stats just on your, your items. You have an inflation problem there. Mm. So, so horizontal pro- progression is probably something Blizzard wouldn't you be can interested do in. Horizontal. I thought horizontal was the way to go, but the uh, designers didn't like it from Molten Core. I loved fire resistance. I thought it was a great way of making gear have uh, value. Uh, but the smarter minds, people that were a lot closer to the uh, numbers than I, uh, disagree. So I don't know if horizontal is something that they're willing to embrace. I don't know if players are going to feel that passionately about mm. horizontal progression. Mm. So, uh, but again, you know, it, it's we're still learning. You know, it's still it's a new game every expansion. 
Have you heard anything at all through the grapevine, uh, appreciating that there's stuff that you can't tell us, but have you heard any kind of words or speculation um, that you would be at liberty to talk about? Anything like when they started working on Classic or any rumours or scuttlebutt that you've tripped apos- across in your travels? Yeah. Um, but by the way, <laughs> I'm so uh, – just so you know, I heard one little thing. That that That's it. Like like a one-sentence thing. All right. Uh, yeah, you know, I don't have like a condo to anyone in Blizzard. In you fact, don't have I'm the, the manifesto. No, 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 no. <laughs> I wasn't actually, I wasn't even talking to someone who's currently working at Blizzard. I was talking to someone who was, you know, talking to someone who's currently at Blizzard. Yeah. So, and, and what's funny is like even a lot of games, uh, game, uh, gaming fans don't even realize if you're on a big team, one department doesn't know what the other per- department is often mm-hmm. doing or why they're doing things, and they don't get out of their, their seat to ask them. So there's a lot of voodoo speculation that is prevalent in on all the forums and everything that's happening on the development team. That's the one thing that was just unless you're in the room, in the meeting, you don't know what's going on. And that's probably the central message of my book. And unless you're actually getting out of your seat, walking over to the person's office and saying, why did, uh, you know, why did uh, Blizzard merge with Activision? Why did we cancel this project? Why did, you know, uh, Blizzard North, you know, close down? Why did this, you know... Until you're talking to the person who is in the room and the meeting, it's you're usually, usually just wrong. And I'm talking about the developers who are actually in the industry on the dev team. Unless they do that, there's a lot of just rumors, (laughs) just bad, bad. Well, it's one so, one of the interesting quotes from your book, and you touched on that very point, which I found super interesting. Where you know you say that basically the public speculation was always wrong, always, always wrong. yeah. So I, if I asked you, ahead. can you remember just if if it comes to mind, do you remember any uh, sort of the most egregiously incorrect thing or rumor you heard about World of Warcraft from the public while you were working on the game? Oh my God. It's, it's, there's, it would be impossible to say. When I say they were wrong, it was they were wrong 100% of the time. It's not 90%. It's not 80%. They were always wrong. Uh, speculation on why the servers were bad. No one had, like, like uh, the, the, the launch of World of Warcraft. Uh, why the servers were just so bad? Do, do, being a fan of Blizzard, do you even know? I'm, I'm, I'm actually asking you. Like people don't realize it was a configuration with the hardware, which was cutting edge, mm-hmm. that the factory uh, uh, wasn't. Uh, I don't want to blame AT and T or their facilities, uh, but there was a configure that one engineer from hardware from not even a blizzard engineer had made that was it once they changed that little toggle or whatever it was all the servers worked just fine Hmm. Um, now they were overloaded (laughs) but uh i i it's just amazing i was listening to uh another podcast the instance i don't know if you uh yeah yeah i know the instance okay okay uh but i was listening to the instance um it's funny. I'm trying to get on their show and I can't get a hold of them. But the instance guys were talking. I'm listening to uh, uh, them speculate about just the simple things of like, oh, why they put these dungeons over here or why. And and I was like pausing it and going, just telling myself, here comes something that's completely wrong. And Every single speculation that hasn't been announced from Blizzard, like you get, you get little bits and pieces from Blizzard, like the BlizzCons and the GDCs, you know, the PR department lets the employees actually give a couple anecdotes, like why they did this, why, why they did that. That's all vetted. Okay. Um, you do get stuff like that. Anything that doesn't come from that, the speculation is 100% wrong 
all the time. And it's not because they're stupid or, or, or you know, a bunch of flame baiters or anything like that. It's that the, the fans have like two or three pieces to a 20 piece puzzle. And they're trying to bridge connections between what they know. And, you know, there's 17 other factors that are just the deciding thing. Uh, so I would say everything. Um, I pick a speculation. Uh, why we went with Starcraft versus uh, or Warcraft versus uh, Starcraft? Uh, it was because Warcraft out you know, fantasy titles outsell other titles. Hmm. Um, that's it. Um, why do Blizzard games sell well? Do you know that? It's uh, people because, love them. <laughs> uh, low system specs. Ah, uh, yes. That's it. That's it. Low system specs. That's your, that is your audience. It's not the guys who are gamers like you and me who are listening to podcasts who are so like people don't realize how small this audience that's listening to this is the casual gamers define the game. There's a time where we were considering world of Warcraft to have no mouse control because we didn't know whether or not we could cut the bandwidth down wow. on mouse uh, movements because and it was based on the EverQuest bandwidths. But mm. EverQuest was like one fourth of San Diego's bandwidth, and we we eventually got to like one tenth or one twentieth of what their band usage was. But uh, we were prepared to say, "Hey, we if we can't afford that's our number one uh, expense is going to be bandwidth. It's, it's not going to be customer support. It's not going to be." We were completely consumed with bandwidth at one point. And then our programmers who were awesome showed, no, 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 we can do, we can reduce our packet size way, way, way down with no appreciable uh, deterioration of, uh, you know, gameplay experience. So, you know, these are the things that you learn, but uh, you know, why does uh, Starcraft and Diablo do well in Korea? It's because you can play the game with one hand. The other hand is for your cigarette. <laughs> Stuff like that. Yeah. You would never, never, never know as, you know, a gamer, you know. And if you don't know that fact, you have speculations why Diablo is selling so well, you know, and why World of Warcraft is not doing so well in Korea, which was our big surprise. We right. thought Korea was going to be huge for World of Warcraft, and it so wasn't because it was too complicated. Um. And until you do the research and stuff like that, you hire the guys and the PR guys and until you pull that data, you don't know that. And you start making connections to things that aren't really there. Um, my whole book is filled with demystifying, like, here's why we did this. It wasn't because of finances. It wasn't because the HQ people were coming down on us to ship this early or put it out the door early. It was because of a technical uh, limitation with MMOs, you know, stuff like that. It was just, it was just crazy. And what's funny is that it kind of makes me feel a little bit better about governments because I see the fan base railing against their favorite games and speculating and criticizing their favorite designers and uh, favorite companies. I, I parallel that to people's unhappiness with uh, government, uh, their dissatisfaction with how the process goes. Hmm. Now, government is not as nearly as, uh, I mean, they're, they're, unless you're in the room, <laughs> you just don't know what's going on. And I have a, having been on both sides of the glass, at least in game development, I feel a little better uh, with what politicians are doing. I think they're a lot more sane than I give them credit because as a fan of politics, I see two pieces of a 20 piece puzzle, you know, and I'm making connections that really aren't there. Mm. So it's kind of funny. I've, I've settled down on politics. Since <laughs> <laughs> so that's a weird tangent there. No, I don't know. I appreciate it. Look, so in the book, John, you mentioned uh, the following uh, sort of, 
I wouldn't call it a throwaway comment, but um, it, it's definitely there, and, and it's something that I'd love to learn more about. You say, right. Tim was planning on working on water effects next because we had plans for an aquatic player race called the Naga. We wanted our water <laughs> yeah. effects to be believable. So the Naga were initially planned to be playable in vanilla. Is that right? Uh, yes, it was one of the wish list things. We had nine races, uh, demons were supposed to be shapeshifters and playable. Those, I think, were also a, uh, I think that was just an artifact from Warcraft 3. They had five, five races instead of four. Uh, then they cut demons out of the, uh, uh, the game for Warcraft 3. And it turned out both the demons, just the requirements and goblins was the other one. Uh, the, the, and it was all art related. Uh, no one could figure out how to get, uh, how do you put Nagas on mounts? How do you put, when Nagas, when, like, if you were going to play a, a Naga, what would your shoulders look like or your armor look like when you have these, uh, fishy, you know, spikes pointing out your back? There's just no way to actually, build a piece of armor and also have it fit the naga and especially with the mounting so many animations would have changed so uh yeah they got a uh, character sketch i think carlo uh on wow uh came up with the uh the concept sketch for the uh uh naga and that's what warcraft 3 went with and that pretty much solidified the look so they couldn't actually more uh go with a more bipedal type of uh um, player race. I mean, the armor set is going to keep all the player races pretty bipedal. Got you. And fantastic. We, we, flowing on from that, there was another quote a couple of pages later that even sort of nearly made me pass out, to be honest, when I read this one. And you said, <laughs> we were worried about the animation workload and had already cut the Naga out of our lineup of player races because their geometry was too different from other, from other player races, like you just explained. Right. But then you said, there was also talk of axing the undead because of our limited resources. But the suggestion was so unpopular with the team that the, de- the debate was postponed until the producers had a better idea of how much work could be handled. So... As I said, I nearly hit the floor when I read that. Could you even imagine World of Warcraft without the undead? Exactly how unpopular was that suggestion? Were there riots? I mean, uh, just as... Um... No, it actually... Uh, it, it was kind of funny. Chris wasn't sure what he wanted to do with the dead. Um, this was before Warcraft 3's uh, storyline was actually solidified. Um, and it caused a lot of confusion in the team. The team, if if the team wanted to do undead... Uh, a lot of the designers wanted to be just a badass monster type of, uh, you know, uh, uh, just an evil type, not a misunderstood plagued human. Okay. One of them's on the coolness level. One of them is a lot cooler than the other. And I think they just kind of went to the center of the spectrum. It wasn't, that's where this, we kept calling the unscourge. This is one thing they, uh, I, 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 I mentioned throughout the book that the team kept referring to the undead as the scourge and Chris, we hadn't, we hadn't played through Warcraft free. So we didn't quite understand that there's the scourge and then there's the, uh, the forsaken, that those are two different kind of factions Uh, for seconds. They're, they're, they're the confused converted uh, humans Mm -hmm. and the scourge are you know directly controlled by the lich king okay and because we hadn't played through all the scenarios of warcraft 3 we didn't actually get the uh uh that split but it wasn't like a big debate um it was floated around that if we couldn't figure it out um it was also if we wanted to do undead we wanted to do really cool stuff there's also oh there's a lot of debates with the undead a lot of people wanted the scourge like buildings which were way cooler than the just the burned out human buildings uh the dungeon designers (laughs) uh dana did all the uh did most of the uh uh scourge buildings they were just converted human buildings and so they were way easier to do and there's it's kind of funny some races are a lot harder to do like their capital city thunder bluff 
took about two weeks to do modeling. It was like the easiest thing in the world because mm. it's simple geometry. Um, the Undercity took uh, Jose and Dana many months to do. There was two uh, level designers working on it, uh, and it's just, you know, I'm glad they did. That was actually the only asset in the dungeon department that I had absolutely no vision for it whatsoever. Uh, Chris had a, a big debate. Um, he even talked about this publicly uh, where he was arguing with the artists uh, that he wanted it to be just a disheveled, broken up city. And the artists wanted it to be kind of like more habitable, uh, not a randomized maze, because a lot of them had nightmares from I forget the city in. Oh, here's a city in, in the Diablo universe where you had to run everywhere to get to all of the uh, the NPCs that you needed to talk to. And they wanted a hub for um, the uh, the Undercity. So Chris wanted to split everything up and just have it kind of wrecked and, you know, like ugly looking. And I think the, the, the level designers won out on that. Like they... They just kind of argued. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I mean, well, that's just kind of how the way things is. You know, like, if as you're a creative director, you're leading the charge, you know, and if and nobody's following you, then you got to change direction. And that's when, and I talk about um, lore, uh, that is Chris's strength, is that he has the wherewithal to recognize there's no traction in this idea. And that happened a number of times. It happened a number of times on the uh, project. But, uh, yeah, the, the, the undead were subject to a number of debates, uh, whether or not, and that was just, and I'm sure we just figured out some tools to optimize. The idea was so bad, then I'm sure the, uh, the animator said, Oh, no, 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 we'll do the undead. We can do it. We can get it under the <laughs> schedule. And it, it, it's just, you know, there's kind of like different watchdogs. You have the producers who are just watching the schedule, you know, they weren't quite the bosses of the team. They were just kind of the grease between the departments, making sure all the departments were kind of happy with the way things are going. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so the, there really wasn't much of a debate. It was, it was the idea was floated that that was a way to save time. And, you know, if you got to You got to You know, I mean, this, this, I don't want to say this project almost bankrupted Blizzard mm. because it was a very expensive game by far anything, just way bigger than anything Blizzard had done before. Uh, but it was, it was a strain. It was certainly a strain on the company. So, uh, yeah, tough decisions sometimes uh, have to be made. Well, I was chatting with Mark Kern just the other night, um, just before uh, we, we were speaking now, and um, he he mentioned when I talked about the Naga comment, he said that Metzen was, and, and Mark's happy for me to quote uh, him back to you, um, he said, Metzen yeah. was so sad when we cut the Naga. And um, I could only imagine that when someone actually said, maybe we yeah. should cut the undead, he would have nearly had a baby. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's it's kind of funny. Yeah, the, it, you asked me, you know, I, I I left this out of my answer when you asked me of something that actually wasn't brought about. Uh, we were there was a lot of pirate fans on the team. Like when uh, oh, I forget the uh, the Pirates of the Caribbean came out. You mm -hmm. know, it was Blizzard just loves 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 pirates. I think it's a Southern California thing that's like just you know a little bit closer to home than Middle America, and it's just a cool meme that a lot of people loved. And our first expansion was going to be something called the South Seas. That was because uh, they were, and I think it was because when I did Booty Bay, everybody was so stoked to just have this little area and saw how cool it was. It was one of the first things that got textured in game and booty Bay was a proving ground for a lot of our frame rate issues. A lot of people thought that, uh, uh, we wouldn't be able to do that as much geometry, um, because of the shooters at the time had absolutely no play spaces near that. And here we're doing an MMO where we don't even have a track of how many players are going to be in that area. So, uh, yeah, so we were so, so enthusiastic about the way Booty Bay and Stranglethorn was looking um, that I think the, the thinking was that the first expansion was going to be our most favorite kind of vibe, which was the, uh, 
the the South Seas type of piratish type of thing. But uh, no, we went to Outland by the end of the project. It just shifted. Oh, let's go to Outland instead. Let's let's. <laughs> Let's do something else. It's fun to hear that the pirates were so popular. I've got one listener and one avid listener who I know will be uh, sort of beside himself knowing that he could have gotten more pirate content because I know a lot of fans love the pirate stuff. But um, another thing I wanted to ask about was you mentioned – you, you spend a little bit of time uh, in the excerpt you sent me talking about the, the following issue, and that was of the debate between procedurally created dungeons and having fewer unique ones. And I'll just read you a, a short quote again from your book where you say that, um, additionally, the procedurally created dungeons employed by Anarchy Online were immediately popular with um, the game designers, being the World of Warcraft game yeah. designers, who declared that right. WoW interior levels should follow Anarchy Online's direction. It was decided that an infinite number of generic dungeons would be better than a smaller number of unique ones, sacrificing flavor for quantity. This decision did not sit very well with the interior level designers. And um, you then mention as well that um, you wound up... Well, uh, first I'll get your comments on that. What was that like when that argument was sort of raging? Uh, that was the nadir for me. That was the very lowest point of the project. Uh, the idea of, I've seen a million people try it since World of Warcraft. Um, people tried to, in fact, we did it on, uh, World of Warcraft. Uh, uh, Jose and Cameron tried to make, uh, Titan architecture and they built like, pillars and baseboards and whenever you try to build a dungeon out of little lego pieces uh that you can copy and paste like once it's textured and it 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 looks very cookie cutter and very generic um we use those pieces for uh oldaman um but uh yeah it just they're not flexible enough and my argument was kind of scary to the, the, the ears of the producers who, again, they're just char- in charge of production, in charge of decisions that affect the schedule. I was arguing that we can actually make custom dungeons, like we can actually do the flavor. But if we build things efficiently, you know, that's uh, that's that's just what we have to do. We have to learn how to do it quickly. And everybody wanted the quick fix band-aid of, oh, we'll just use a different system that kind of does the work for us. And, uh, yeah, so we had, I mean, from Alan Adham, all the game designers just loved the fact that somebody had the, they loved the concept of infinite, infinite content. That was the biggest worry for the – I didn't really stress that enough in my book. The, the worry of not making enough content was just all-encompassing for most of the project. That's why our dungeons were so big. That's why we had zones that – when we realized that, oh, wait, we can only give so many items. And you don't realize that until you play – characters and level up and see how long it takes you to upgrade your shoulders, how long it takes you to upgrade your pants. And it, it it's kind of, once you learn that, then they can make decisions that, okay, this is how long players are going to be in a zone. Uh, if the zone's way, way, way too big, you know, there's no point f- for them to even be in that zone. So, uh, uh, it's it's kind of connected, like the leveling curve, how fast you level affects how much the size of the the zones and everything. So uh, yeah, when when the procedural dungeons was floated and it was only floated for a week, uh, I said, okay, you guys get a plan. I'm going to continue on my path uh, of making customized dungeons until you do have a plan. Like they were trying to figure out, okay, what are the all, all the layouts? There's an elbow section, a T section, a straight section, and a, and it's just a really, I mean, the result. I had no doubt in my mind that they would have seen the result. I just didn't want to waste more time pursuing something that was going to be abandoned. This was right after we had uh, thrown away me personally, nine months worth of work. And these are like 90 hour weeks 
worth of work. So when I say nine months of work, that's a lot of work that we mm. just threw out when we abandoned the first person shooter uh, BSP method of building dungeons. Then we went to a, a way more better product, the uh, 3D Studio Max, which in my opinion is still the best tool for uh, uh, making dungeons. But uh, um, that's that's a that's a holy war between a lot of developers. There's a lot of people who <laughs> love their different. Uh, that's a, that's a different uh, debate with other developers. But uh, yeah, that was I was ready. I mean, I mean, if they really really were going. I probably would have, you know, I mean, I don't enjoy the Diablo games as much because, and in fact, the level designers want a big, want, they want to build big, big, big pieces. And the game designers on Diablo, they need the smaller sections to connect up all these, you know, big pieces. So there's there's a fight between those two. Um, but of course, the uh, game designers, after a week of playing these generic dungeons, they said, wow. This is really crummy. Let's let's uh let's let's not go this way because it's like you know that you've seen it before. It's it's there's there's not they're not as cool. Mm. Well, I love that you say you you helped to sway the debate at a certain point, and you've mentioned a couple of times that you are a big D and D fan, as a lot of my listeners are. And you, yeah. you, I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly. You say you you wound up modeling the hidden shrine of Tamar Chan uh, in a week in order to prove that unique dungeons could be done quite quickly. How how did that feel doing that as a bit of proof of concept? Well, it was just in and, and what I mean proof of concept. We couldn't load any dungeons in the game at this point. I just had. I learned how to, uh, and this is for the 3DS Max fans out there, shift to drag edges. I mean, I was brand new to the package. No one on the team shift dragged edges. And what that meant is that, say if, if you had a tunnel, okay, uh, uh, a, a piece of geometry that's like uh, uh, a tube, you could select the very edges of that tube and extrude them to have another uh, ring of polygons and you could keep extruding, 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 and then stretch and expand. And, and that was way better than just building one polygon at a time. Uh, once I saw that, I said, I know how we can do this game. You know, it was obvious to me I, once I learned the tool, but no one on in Blizzard actually used that method. It was more like uh, they would create uh, a you know, objects at a time, and then they would, you know, deform those objects to whatever uh, shape that they wanted. So once I learned this technique, uh, I was very able to very quickly just show, look, here's a full dungeon. And I just grabbed Tomochikan because, and I'm sure I'm saying it incorrectly too. <laughs> uh, I played I played the level when I was like 12 years old. So mm. pronunciations weren't, you know, the highest <laughs> priority. So uh, I, 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 I fleshed this out. And I showed the producers just what it looked like in 3D Studio Max. I said, look, there we go. There's a dungeon. And it was so much cleaner than the BSP. They just fell in love with it. They were, they were just super, super stoked. They said, you're right. This is a way to go. Um, and, of course, I am not shy with uh, – it's kind of funny. You, you accused me of having, being very humble. I'm not even remotely humble when I'm on the <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I hope none of my own teammates are listening to that <laughs> when you said that because, uh, um, They'd have a I, I'm really, well, yeah, I mean, I, I know what I'm doing and I'm not shy about, Hey guys, look, this is the right way to do it. Da, 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 and I hopefully, you know, clip for my, uh, my, my work to speak for itself. But if not, you know, I'll talk your ear off. Um, but that's kind of how that happened. No, I but of course we just we threw it away after uh, no one wanted. I mean, it was really bad geometry. Like the entire dungeon may have been maybe a thousand polygons or mm. or two thousand poly, which is way, way, way low. You know, it's uh, but the fact that we could picture a character running through that space, which actually a thousand poly, that, those were about the, uh, the polygon count of the EverQuest dungeons. So it was kind of comparable, but uh, 
Yeah. So. <laughs> well, thank. I, I can say yeah. a big thank you, basically, for that watershed moment that ensured that we did get the unique dungeons that we got, rather than sort of um, randomly generated ones. But another thing we we spoke about uh, is that um, the just the the thought of instancing itself, and and again, a, a comment I got from um, Mark Kern about that in chatting the other day was, he said that. Uh, you basically stole instancing from Anarchy Online, and, and you guys would joke around the office about how if Funcom had actually painted, uh, patented, patented instancing, they would have made a lot of money. Um, it, that's kind of... I remember you know, the original pitch. It's kind of funny. I, I have the inception of, wow, uh, the lead animator of... Uh, before the predecessor to WoW was a project called Nomad. Nomad was a canceled game that was just a miserable failure by everyone's uh, uh, agreement that Team 2 tried, and this was before I was there, they tried and failed. And the lead animator, Kevin Beardsley, put together this little PowerPoint presentation to say, hey, and Kevin was a big EQ fan, uh, a big EQ player, and he said, hey, this is, you know, he envisioned uh, like the WASD controls with a uh, camera following you, kind of like uh, uh, EverQuest, but he, private dungeons was kind of like, we didn't call them instances back then. That's kind of where the concept of private dungeons came. Uh, uh, Anarchy Online was the first one to implement it. It was... They were, you know, they were going in the direction. We were already going in that direction. Uh, when they proved that it could be fun, um, then we said, okay, w- the direction we're going, this is the right direction. So uh, we didn't quite steal it from Anarchy Online, but it was nice to see, uh, you know, somebody, uh, you know, pl- plumb the depths for us. I mean, mm. You know, pioneers are the ones with arrows in their backs, so uh, we're happy to uh, be uh, the second wave. Now, something else that you, you touched on, I've got a listener question from Listener Seven Winters who says that um, even though it's not quite the topic of this particular chat, you did work on Titan and before it was essentially scrapped and its assets were used to develop Overwatch. Do you have any insight into what we you know, haven't heard about what Titan was before it was, the decision was made to basically um, you know, use it for scrap for Overwatch? Right. Uh, I was, this is, this kind of falls under the, uh, uh, categories like I'll let Blizzard talk about it, sure. uh, if they want to. I, I wasn't a big fan of the concept of it. Uh, it was another MMO. And so it was a little bit, uh, oh boy, it's, it's, it's hard to make an MMO. So, um, uh, yeah, if Blizzard wants to actually reveal more, uh, information about Titan, uh, uh, I could, you know, comment on, on yep, that, but no I don't worries. want to be the mouthpiece for that. No, yeah. no worries. Understand. Um, now, we asked you about some of the dungeons that you loved and some of the hardest ones to work on. Are there any, are there any dungeons that you made that you actually dislike, or that are they all your babies? Or was there an ugly stepchild that you weren't particularly proud of or anything like that? Uh, let's see. Well, on Crush is still my favorite whipping, uh, whipping boy, but uh, let's see. Um... I'm kind of happy. I wish people had gone. I wish that there were more assets and more war for, uh, oh, what's the one? Um, it's the Night Elf dungeon in uh, Ashenvale. Black Fathom Deeps. Yeah, Black Fathom Deeps, yeah. Yeah, yeah Black Fathom was, um, that was kind of hard. I was, I was learning. I just finished Wailing Caverns and I had another Earthen type of i was i was i was jumping at the bit to do architecture and i and uh that was a lower level dungeon so it was kind of safer to do that one so i went from uh whaling caverns and i I went from ankarash whaling caverns did that and it was okay um i that was the scene of a a big uh, debate on transparent water uh but i'm kind of happy with it i just wish i would have cut out some of the uh like the maze section that also whaling caverns 
uh, it's kind of funny. Scott Mercer, <laughs> he very, I saw Scott like a number of years ago and he very sheepishly said that, yeah, in one of the expansions, he got rid of the maze section in Wailing Caverns and he was almost apologetic. I'm like, thank God that was the worst section in Wailing Caverns. Um, I wish a lot of my dungeons were smaller. Wailing Caverns is just way too big. Uh, so there, there, there's things I would have changed about some of them, um, but I'm pretty happy with uh, the way a lot of them uh, turned out. Uh, so, yeah, that's that's probably it. I I, I think uh, yeah, Black Fathom was just a little bit too oppressive. Mm. Um, I I was going for that, and I kind of hit the mark too much. It was supposed to be just a different vibe and I, I went for this really I wanted to be claustrophobic and instead of lowering the ceiling uh, to kind of like you know make it a, a more claustrophobic I widened the hallways and I it actually worked so well that even though the ceiling was high the, the, the hallways were really really wide um, I had uh, Bill Petra say hey the, the can the, these ceilings are too low. We got to make them bigger. The ca- he's, he was worried about the camera knocking against the ceilings. And <laughs> we jumped in game. I showed him, look, it's actually just an optical illusion. Hmm. Uh, so I think the thing that I was going for was just the wrong direction. And honestly, there wasn't a lot of lore. Um, classical Greek Romanesque architecture is very hard to work with. It's hard to make it cool. I don't like any of the tar- Titan stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I, it's, it's, uh, it's just a little, uh, uninteresting because you have to be symmetrical. You have, you, there's a look. You can't really deter from it. It's just kind of, uh, too, uh, rigid, uh, of an, uh, of an architectural style to actually make stuff cool unless you're rubbling it out. Which is what I did. Um, so I don't know. I, I, I it was mediocre. Uh, Upper Black Rock, Rock Spire was okay, you know. But um, uh, yeah, everything else I'm pretty happy with. Okay. Now, sorry, mate. I've got a couple more, but I don't want to push my luck with you. So. No. Oh, thank no. you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You, you mentioned, uh, we talk about things like, you know, cut content like Grim Batol, Dragon Isle, Isles, Oldham, Northrend was originally planned to be in vanilla, uh, the Furbold Keep in Azshara, you know, these yeah. places with all this mystique that vanilla players are yeah. like, what if, what if? Can you tell us at all, what, what, what was the plan in terms of, were they raids? Were they higher item levels than Nax Ramus? Were we meant to go there after Nax? What was the kind of loose plan? Uh, the loose plan was Chris would come up with ideas. Okay, this was, um, I have an early sketch of our dungeon layouts uh, late in the book. I'm guessing around just throwing this out there. It's in the dungeon section. I'm going to guess around like, I don't know, maybe 300, 280, something like that in the book. And it was the, uh, it's on graph paper. I wrote it down and I just copied it from the board. Chris was coming up with places. Okay. And when we had technology to run around in game, uh, we were just going to build some places uh, and see what could be done with this place. Um, it was way too... Eric Dodds is very, uh, just an amazing game designer. He would also uh, point out, he would often point out that game design documents are for the designer. Okay, There's a lot of designers that don't work uh, uh, in a loosey-goosey way like that, and Blizzard is in a comfortable position where they can iterate and change things. And so Eric stresses that don't fall in love with these documents because no one else is ever going to see them. Like you're going to have technology changes. You're going to have design changes of other departments changing things uh, that are going to just win a little change. And that entire game design document that you spent uh, 14 days on is now dead. You know, it doesn't apply to the things. So, we knew at we knew this at the you know going into WoW that maybe uh, let's see Tolbarad was actually originally one of the first dungeons we worked on. We just pushed it off. We didn't need it. It was on an island, I think, at the time. I still don't know uh, if Tolbarad 
God was is still on an island, but uh, we just pushed that to something else. And we had rearrange places like, uh, you know, uh, the location of cities and the location of areas of interest uh, just changed when we realized, okay, as we work with something, we realize, oh, there's nothing cool in this zone. We got to put something cool in this zone. Uh, what fits? You know, now lore, that's when a lore steps in and says, uh, that doesn't really belong there. There's no reason why the orcs would go that far to get there. So let's move this to, you know, closer to, the... and that, that, that's kind of like the methodology. So there was nothing concrete as saying, oh, this is going to be a raid. Uh, we weren't, we weren't even talking about raids. Uh, like, well, that's actually not true because I started, uh, Karazhan as, a dungeon and at the top there was going to be a raid and then on Karash was at, at a raid. Uh, but it it's fluid. You know, if it doesn't look good, we would cut out some of the rooms and then it wouldn't be a raid. It would be a dungeon. So, yeah, a lot of the decisions happened right at the uh, the tail end of the project. Nice. Well, you kind of answered my next question there because I was going to ask, you know, how far did you get along in the design of the cut content? Were there any bosses designed or anything that we don't know about? But it sounds like, no, no, not quite. No, no, no. They wouldn't even get textured. The pain point for the, for a lot of the areas was, uh, the, the art, uh, the texturing was the pain point for the dungeons. If it got textured, it went into the game. I mean, uh, Jose's version of Karazhan is probably the only exception of that because it just wasn't big enough to actually have uh, uh, fights in it. But, um, yeah, if it got textured, we used it for something. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Now, you mentioned as well the concept that um, didn't wind up being in the game, and, and it's always fun when you reference influences from other games, whether they actually made it into World of Warcraft or not. It's always interesting to hear what the developers are playing and what kind of ideas they're, they're tinkering with um, using as influence in the, the game that they're working on. You talked about Animal Crossing, of all things, and you said yeah. that the notion of time-based rewards was something that you would have loved to, uh, the, the team would have loved to have seen implemented in world of warcraft in terms of you know planting something and actually waiting a set amount of time to reap the rewards from it now right. what, what more can you tell us about that and how close did we get to actually getting it um well you actually got it there were some we the well first of all it came along as a concept uh, that's what we were just shocked that all the game designers were playing it uh, and the concept of making players wait holds them that th- so far no game had ever uh, put value on the quality of anticipation. And that was the first game to do it, to, to my mind. Maybe there were, but uh, what we did uh, use is we had, uh, I think uh, you finish a quest and they would mail you the... Um, the reward it would show up in the mail and i can't remember which quest did it we did it i think just once or twice and it was eh, you know it's okay you know it kind of sucked because some people kept uh leveling up and then they got a better item and then by the time that thing arrived it was like oh well uh i've already got something that replaces that that would have been nice to have (laughs) Mm. earlier Mm. but i that that actually did make it to uh, Vanilla WoW, but um, the concept of player housing is where it was going to apply most. Right. I had done a experiment of showing how uh, a castle could be – I had this concept of a guild castle and the idea of having guilds uh, fight over castles – And each castle would be physically located in the world and would have a different set of prestige. Like there would be the low level castle and this would just tie into PVP. It was just some grandiose thing that needed all kinds of features to happen. And of course, you know, all those, those type of ideas don't make it to an MMO. (laughs) You just, you're just trying to make the MMO, but I was kind of an amateur, uh, 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 designer at that point. Um, I got there on my, my, my art cred, so I, uh, I had this idea. But I showed a, I could, at least, build evidence of a guild hall. And I showed the different 
sets of uh, turrets and uh, drawbridges and gatehouses. And as the guild levels up their guild house, it, um, you know, all these little components kind of like change. The problem was, is that we couldn't figure out what to do in the guild house. There was nothing uh, in guild and, and animal crossing came along and said, well, the concept of planting a tree and then it yielding things uh, like apples, they give bonuses or something like that uh, was what was attractive to us. Now, the problem is by the time we got that far, uh, all those trees and all the functionality with player housing would have just yielded a duplicate system in the game. Uh, and so at a point, everybody was just rolling their eyes when somebody would talk about player housing because no one, it's a concept that no one could figure out what to do. And that's kind of like a good example of a bad game idea where you have a concept and you're trying to figure out gameplay. And you usually want to go the opposite way. Um, you you, you want to start with gameplay that leads to uh, uh, player housing. So, um, And I know uh, World of Warcraft did do something uh, with player housing, but uh, that, was, uh, bef- that was after I had uh, left the game. Mm. Another instance that you worked on that we haven't touched on, which a lot of players do really enjoy, is that of Scholomance. Can you tell us your memories of building Scholomance and any difficulties you made it, may have had in coming up with it and how it may have changed through the process? Um, yes, I can. In fact, I have an article coming out on Wowhead uh, a day before my Kickstarter, you know, promotional article. And it's uh, called the uh, Scholomance uh, uh, Bones to Pick. And it was all the debates over Scholomance, how it came about, uh, post-launch Scholomance. Um, and it was the site of a number of debates for the team. So um, it's a long, it's, I think it's 3,000 words. So it's, it's, it's a thorough, <laughs> thorough telling of Skullmance. Uh You only have to wait nine days for that. So uh, I, I'm going to let that speak for itself. No, perfect. <laughs> I, I look forward to right it. On. Excellent. Um, we, we touched on Karazhan a little bit that you mentioned you built with uh, Aaron Keller. And right. in terms of how that one was actually received, and, and obviously we didn't really get to go through that until the Burning Crusade, were you surprised with how beloved Karazan became? Because I can tell you, I know it's my favorite instance in the game. Yeah. Um, it's not surprising because there was, there was so much work put into it. And that's usually... Um, Molten Core is a huge exception to that, but I think Molten Core would not stand up if they released Molten Core. Who knows? Maybe the fog was cool enough that it could, you know, uh, uh, support its own weight. But when you have that many um, artists, I, uh, Pat Nagel was a, a, a quest designer at the time, and he spent weeks and weeks and weeks on uh, the chess event. And he basically was only tasked to spend a couple weeks on it. So what he, like, he would just say, well, it's kind of bugged. So I'm going to spend a little bit longer time. <laughs> like it was unfinished. It took a longer time, but that's kind of the, a lot of stuff was poured into that. And yes, when you put that many resource into it, uh, old Alar was another example, uh, tons of uh, art particle effects objects unique pieces of art it all brings a place alive when you're just regurgitating stuff which is frankly how i worked through most of uh, world of warcraft uh the only texture set that i got that i got to work with that was really robust was the uh, black rock spire and i was able to make well geez two raid dungeons, Blackrock Mountain, and, you know, three uh, high-level dungeons out of it. So that's what you can do when you have a lot of resources. So it's not surprising that fans are so happy with uh, something that got so much love from the developers. And, frankly, that stuff happens because it was between uh, deadlines. Like, if other stuff was happening, if, if other things were happening that would have pulled 
uh, art resources or design resources out of it, it would have been less cool, you know. Um, so some of it's kind of random, but it was a place that had a lot of lore. Um, it's the only Warcraft book I ever read was a, a book about uh, uh, Kargath and uh, Medivh um, uh, doing something at uh, Karazhan. And I was just getting a, a feel for, you know, for the tower. And uh, I was so bummed out that the movie didn't use our uh, <laughs> design for the tower. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> was there a most memorable room that you worked on in Karazhan? Um, let's see. I like the logic on the very base of the uh, uh, the tower. Um, I liked how the stables were right next to the front gate. And mm-hmm. I liked how the stables mm-hmm. worked up. And, you know, the kitchen's on a low-level kitchen. You know, like it, it, it's it's kind of um, – well, actually, no. I Actually, the kitchen was a low level. but it's, it, was not, um, it felt like a service entrance kind of deal. I, I liked that. Right. It, yeah, that's, that's kind of how uh, towers are – you know, I love going on tours on old mansions. You know, that, that's one of the things my family always did is I love architecture. Any old mansion where there's a tour, I am so – I'm so stoked to go to that. <laughs> uh, and I've gone all around uh, the United States where a lot of uh, – big mansions were built and, mm. you know, you get a tour in the history of a family, but you just kind of learn the logic behind a large building. And I'm just proud that it feels like a place, like a realistic place. Uh, and I rubbled out the, the tower. I, I thought it did a pretty good job in opening up the tower. Uh, a lot of people thought like, once you go into the tower, you should just be um, closed off. And, what I mean by that is that you never see the outdoors again. Like you just stay inside the tower. And I, it's, it's kind of funny if you saw the tower. Oh my gosh. I actually do have some pictures of what that tower looked like. Um, It's imagine Karazhan being okay. A, uh, like a water bottle. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's the shape of the tower. Mm -hmm. Okay. The actual rooms for that are floating beside the water tower because a water bottle because that water bottle is too thin to actually contain the physical rooms inside it. Mm. And so once you zone in, you go to this fake parallel world where you do have the land surrounding you, but you we keep it hidden from you that floating in the air are all the uh, rooms for Karazhan. So it was a very technically difficult uh, – um, uh, it, it wasn't technically difficult. It was a very abstract way to work. Um, and it was kind of like standing on the shoulders of uh, what we achieved with uh, Shadow Fang and doing it again. And so I was able to get players to go up to the top. I really wanted them to get to the very top of the tower and uh, you know, be able to look at the land. I think that's – very important to connect the inside, the interior with the exterior. Um, and unfortunately, uh, that's kind of inconvenient to do, and you have to plan that from the beginning. So it's uh, it's tough to pull off. You touched on Black Rock Mountain again just earlier, and you talked about your, your love for the area in general. Um, and a listener, Seismic Rand, again says, Black Rock Mountain's central room is an amazing set piece. It's both monumental and interactive. What inspired the carved dwarven statues holding the massive chains? Um, well, the, okay, so that I go into detail in The Wild Diary uh, because it is my favorite piece. Ah. Um, the, the original design and – spoiler alert, here it comes – uh, the original piece was the that there would be two concentric rings, one above the other. And one ring would go to Upper Black Rock Spire, and the other ring would go to uh, another dungeon, Black Rock Depths or something. The, the rock in the center, there was actually a bridge that was supposed to go from these rings to the other uh, – to, to the bridge – and what I did is I just com- I looked at the elements and I'm like that's kind of lame. Like if unless there's a lot of reason to be on that bridge, let's kind of make it feel like uh, 
uh, people are sneaking there. And that's where I got the chains. The, the dwarves, uh, someone made the suggestion of dwarven statues because the concept was literally, it's a big hollow mountain and there's like a chain uh, hanging uh, over lava. Okay, like, the, like that rock area in the center mm-hmm. was suspended. Uh, and so I just got rid of the bridges and used the, the chains as uh, the bridges. And that was, that, that was what the concept that I had to work with. Um, someone suggested, well, what you could do is just use, you know, uh, uh, dwarf statues. And I kind of, I mean, I've seen statues. We just done the hall of, uh, oh, not hall of, uh, the procession uh, in front of store went. I forget the Valley of Heroes, I think it's called. Mm -hmm. Um, And I kind of like, that was one of my pet peeves with the rest of the team. So I would criticize those statues. I hate it when a developer just takes a player model and puts a stone texture on it and calls it a statue. Uh, Stone is fashioned differently than uh you know material and hair and you know uh metal it's it's a little bit blockier and so i didn't want to go that route so what i did is i uh just kind of used i was anchoring the chains into the the cavern so i thought well it'd be kind of cool if these giant dwarves were holding the chains and so i went to dan moore who was a uh, who was basically our top uh, prop uh, artist? He 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 knew uh, 3ds Max more, and he could pose uh, the dwarves in you know some type of holding a rough holding pattern, like like they're holding a chain. And that was just a matter of just like changing the animations. And then he exported them, and that's how I used. Uh, uh, we just threw a stone texture on them, and. You know, I, I I got my you know because I was the, the the guy doing it. I got my nice fat blocky models for the uh, uh, the guys. But now it's just a matter of combining the elements so that they kind of hold together. You know, uh, we got rid of the bridge instead of two concentric rings. We got to one that was tilted. So it with the tilt is there because two reasons. Uh, it looks better uh, if you have a big flat area. It, it's not as exciting to the eye as if you tilt it a little bit. You can appreciate the sense of space a little bit more. So that ring uh, is tilted that, that, that goes around the lava, um, and it's also a tilt that uh, accommodates the uh, elevation change from Searing Gorge to the, uh, the, the zone beneath it. I forget what it's called, but, um, yeah, it was, I was just happy uh, just design-wise how it turned out. And I was just sticking dwarven buildings into the <laughs> sides of the uh, uh, rock to just achieve this idea of, oh, wow, you know, there's people up there living that way. <laughs> and, you know, in fact, it's like, you know, you know, a half hour worth of work just arranging these buildings. So it was, it was a fertile, fertile territory to work in. Mm. In speaking earlier, you mentioned one short instance of some input you would get from Jeff Kaplan on, on an instance you were working on, you know, saying, oh, you know, that everything's great. If you could just cut just this one little bit, you know, everything's great. And you've yeah. mentioned Chris a fair few times and all the interactions you've had with Chris. But just if we could focus on Jeff here, what was your working relationship like with Jeff and how would he kind of interact with your team? And, and just basically an, an invitation to go on about Jeff a little bit. What was he like to, to work with? Uh, someone who had such an influence on this game. Oh yes, well, um, he started out as a quest uh, designer. Um, he needed to learn the tools. That's how he learned the tools uh, of how to script things, how to uh, place spawns and stuff like that. So uh, once he came to the team, um, uh, he also just knew MMOs. Uh, he had uh, proof of concept of hiring Jeff, well, he, his, his website uh, was a, just a wonderful source of how an MMO should be when he was uh, spending, spilling so much ink critiquing uh, EverQuest. So, you know, Alan and Adam would joke, you know, for a price of uh, a Jack in the Box meal, which is a, it's like the lowest fast food chain out here in uh, uh, the United States. Mm. We could just, pick his brains and just get this great information and you know we totally want to hire this guy if he's willing you know to work and of course 
you know, he's, he's, this is what he was born to do. So, uh, no, Jeff came on uh, board and he was sto- he was just so enthusiastic about things. And I was also so enthusiastic about things. Um, we just, uh, enjoyed, uh, making a lot of, uh, uh, you know, cool stuff together. We both seem to kind of get it. Uh, I would wear this. We we would joke. <laughs> I, I wore this uh, uh, path between my. We were on opposite sides of the building for 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 a lot of the time. So I just wear this path through the carpet of my my office to his office, and it was always the same question: Is this dungeon too big? Is this <laughs> you know? Is is you know? Should I make this? Because I got this idea. It's kind of cool, and it was practically for every dungeon, and. <laughs> Jeff, this is way before we were even playing in group content. We didn't even have solo play down. We had no idea how many monsters people would be fighting. We had no idea how long combat would take. Uh, it was just nice to talk to a designer that would just give you an answer. Like the rest of the mm-hmm. designers, they didn't want to be responsible for telling us, oh, yeah, build this way, and then six months or a year later, or two years later, they'd have to say, you know how we told you to go ahead and do everything non-linear? Yeah, you're going to have to redo all that work and do it linear. So Jeff, had, he got MMOs um, enough that he would just say, John, when in doubt, make it bigger. That was that was one mantra. The other one was, um, and I, I, I quote this in the book, is uh, there's no such thing as a dungeon too big. And He's borrowing from EverQuest's paradigm where they're instant, they're non-instanced. So, and again, we, he was so, everyone was, everyone on the team was so terrified that it, we wouldn't have enough content because we were trying to make a very uh, casual game, but casual games, you can burn through content quickly. We just didn't know, you know, would people be done with our game? we needed subscriptions. You know, we, w- we didn't want people to, uh, cause there's no proof of concept of, uh, subscriptions. Kind of like how I said, Diablo was the proof of concept, uh, that RPGs would be, uh, good for the, the, the broad audience, the casual players. Uh, the same was true. Uh, same was true with wow. Is that we didn't know whether a subscription game was going to be popular with the casual audience. And so we didn't want our uh, users to just connect to the game, play it like crazy for two months, and then save $15 a month by uh, just disconnecting and waiting for the next expansion. So uh, Jeff and everyone on the team was paranoid that we wouldn't have content. So that's why the dungeons were just so big. So, uh, um, And he loved the fact that uh, uh, there were, he he – we we kind of refer to each. I mean, he's he's one of the heroes of the the project. He refers to me as one of the heroes of the project. Is that what we did? Is we worked way harder and uh, had had an influence on the project that it would inspire the people who are kind of burnt out to to put in an extra effort. Mm. Uh, that hey, mm. if John's working so crazy on the weekends, you know, I'll accommodate John. You know, and and his uh, you know ornery ways of of getting something done, even if it's a little bit more work on my end. And so that's kind of how uh, uh, our relationship was. So it was, uh, it was really good. So, yeah, it would have been better if we were on the same side of the building. Mm. But <laughs> you know. Well, with the two of you kind of being cut from the same cloth, uh, as you say, and, and um, you know, the working relationship that you did have, uh, there's, you know, Jeff's obviously almost nearly 20 years into his career at Blizzard, and we all see the the refined, mature version of him when he speaks about, you know, he's obviously moved on to Overwatch and things like that, and he, he's so influential when he speaks on game design and things of that nature. But right. what I want to know is that if people do a, big, a bit of digging around, everyone knows that Jeff was, as you say, a madcap EQ player back in the day, and, and yeah. he had all these notions on what an MMO should be. And he has, you know, there's one particularly... Uh, infamous uh, expletive laden rant that he's gone on in the past, which is very, very fun and very funny when, when you look at it now. <laughs> so what I'm yeah. asking is, did you get that version of Jeff back in the day where he would just rant and rave and be so passionate? Like, was there, you know, corporate Jeff absolutely. and then behind the scenes Jeff? No, absolutely not, because he was preaching to the choir. Like, he was... He was ranting a rave against against the team, uh, the the 
it was Verant at the time. It wasn't Sony Online. Um, they had lightning in a bottle. They they had they discovered this way of playing a, a video game, and they just didn't know what to do with it. You know, they they were the first ones. They 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 were the only ones out there. And hey, if you you've got ten thousand sub- subscribers or you know a hundred thousand or whatever, I don't think they ever had like. I, I can't. I can't remember their subscriber base, but they, you know, uh, they couldn't be wrong. You know, it was there was just it's we're making money, so obviously there's no way to improve our product. That was kind of their attitude in a lot of ways, um, and that's a gross simplification. But uh, it's the frustration of somebody knowing the flaws. I'm I'm kind of the same way with with board games i have to very very be i have to trod carefully because i like board games but so many of them are bad (laughs) Mm. so uh i i i I have to like edit myself um uh because frankly i haven't made any board games you know who am i in that space so uh i uh until i do boy look out (laughs) so uh jeff was absolutely the most pleasant person to work with he's actually uh he no, there's he never raised his voice, never was never lost a um he was actually a uh uh he would call him, you know, some he, he would he'd be diplomatic. He was very diplomatic. But no, he was he was home. You know, when he came to Blizzard it was like we got it. You know, you know, he got it and we got it. There's no reason to really bump heads, you know, or mm. bump uh, shoulders too much. So uh uh no, he was uh he was a nice and uh genial jeff kaplan <laughs> <laughs> who was the wild card who was the person who could just absolutely light up the office by being a little bit zany a little bit crazy uh a little bit out there uh yeah <laughs> well i gotta let's see i would say let's see uh roman kenny was just hilarious he was he was a great great fun to work with um my favorite, uh, this isn't in the book before I got there, he would, uh, he would wear these like, uh, kimonos or something like that. Cause he would, uh, he, he would, uh, play EverQuest and he'd have these big kimonos and, um, he'd walk around. That's how he'd work. He's like, hell, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm good at what I do. I can wear what I want. <laughs> so what he did is one time, and this is long before I was there where <laughs> what he would do is, have you seen Beetlejuice? Yeah. There's a there's a scene in Beetlejuice where he goes to the land of the dead. Mm-hmm. He goes to the uh, the the equivalent of the uh, Department of Motor Vehicles, yep. where it's a bureaucratic nightmare. And there's a scene of a guy who has been flattened by a steamroller. Yep. And he's sliding through. So Roman would put his arms up so that he would be flat, and they he'd like crab walk sideways and with, with and he'd bug his eyes out like the guy that was dead and he would do this <laughs> and he would do this like that's how he would walk through the hall sometimes just as a goof just to uh uh crack people up well he did it outside <laughs> there was a meeting with the uh the owners of blizzard uh i think it was a davidson group the fourth of the universal just a bunch of suits you know mm. just sitting down and then they see roman <laughs> with his arms outstretched you know shimmying sideways with with a crazy look on his face <laughs> just walking down the hallway you know <laughs> just just the weird weird uh sense of humor that he has but uh yeah roman could always crack me up like he, you know him and uh him and toff would get together and those two would crack each other up no one would even know what they're laughing at like they wouldn't, they wouldn't even say anything they'd just start laughing at each other and uh yeah, so that I would have to go to uh, Roman. He was uh, he was a hoot. With all the personalities that you had in the office and the growing, growing amount of staff that this project would accumulate over the years, you mentioned in your book that two years into development, sort of just after you got there, about six months into your tenure, still no one outside of Blizzard knew about World of Warcraft and the project that you were working on. Were there any concerns about leaks, and how does Blizzard go about tightening that 
well, basically, you know, running such a tight ship that they're so confident that nothing gets out. And obviously it's pertinent with what's coming with Classic because we haven't heard anything. Um, it's actually, I think there's, like, people in the industry, they probably knew what we were working on. And, like, my reticence in speaking with Titan or in, you know, outside myself, like, People at it knew what we were working on, uh, developers around the industry. Uh, we we kind of respect one another, you know. Um, so it was – it's not as tight as you think it is, um, but it just doesn't go public. And frankly, if it does go public, uh, thanks to our the, the, the screaming Blizzard fans, uh, a lot of them will shout them down, you know, even though they're saying, you know, like, you know, who are you? You know, unless they're actually from Blizzard, uh, you're drowned out with uh, uh, the noise of the rest of the Internet. So, yeah, you could say Blizzard's working on an MMO, but unless it comes from Blizzard, you know, no one's going to pay attention. They'll say, no, it's not. It's going to be a StarCraft MMO, you know, or, you know, or Diablo or whatever. So that's kind of the way that worked. It was hard. It, that was one of the... Uh, hard parts uh, about making a project in secret is that you couldn't talk about it. Uh, you couldn't have a party with a bunch of Blizzard people and a bunch of your friends in the same party uh, because, you know, people talk shop and then it gets a little, gets a little weird and you, you don't want to be the person hosting <laughs> that type of event if something gets out like that. So uh, yeah, the leaks happen, but frankly, uh, you just, you just, you know, you, you don't, you don't say anything. I mean, like you might say something to your family or something like that, but unless it comes from Blizzard, nobody believes them. I think it's just a self-correcting type of a phenomenon. Right. Now, uh, sorry, just uh, two, uh, one last question. Well, this is it, John. And this is from a, a listener, Isol, who asks this. Horde or Alliance? And why is it Horde? <laughs> so my follow-on question from that is, people talk about a faction bias within Blizzard, and they say, Blizzard yeah. clearly prefers the Alliance, and then you hear, Blizzard clearly prefers the Horde. Who do you like, and can, what can you do to dispel or prove any kind of faction bias within Blizzard? Uh, I talk about this in my book. Uh, Blizzard... At least on the developers for both Team 1 and Team 2, the Warcraft uh, 3 guys and the World of Warcraft guys. Warcraft uh, 3 guys became the StarCraft guys. And then, you know, I mean, uh, but back at the, d the day, everyone was for the Horde. Everyone was for the Horde, the developers, which was kind of funny because when you're an artist and you're thinking of outfits and you're thinking of buildings and you're thinking of just props uh, uh tables and chairs and stoves and stuff you think in human terms okay so only until we were playing the alpha we, we realized like the horde outfits were being outnumbered like the horde assets were outnumbered like uh you know, 10 to 1. I mean, it was, and, and actually, frankly, because it's easier, you start with humans. So the human starting zone was the first zones that we started working on. Um, then we moved to dwarf, which is a little bit further away from humans. Um, then I think then we took the uh, the plunge and went over to the orcs. But uh, uh, no, only until the game was playable did we realize, wow, there's like the NPC outfits were all human. And it's so... Yeah, believe it or not, most of the devs were horde, 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 horde. Uh, Metzen always played paladins, so uh, he was he was he was you know an outlier. But um, uh, yeah, and and I guess I I'm more horde too. Uh, I was the uh, I was a Torin. Out of interest, you mentioned obviously your foray into the board games industry. Now, what do you say for some of your favorite board games, and what have you got plans for that career move? Um, I have been working on a board game that, uh, I think I'm going to, I, I'm working on a dungeon crawl board game. So, uh, uh, I think that, that there's a lot of, uh, Im improvement in that sphere. It's, it's an audience that I think is very passionate. 
Um, I don't like a lot of the uh, uh, the most popular board games. I think there's too many rules. There's it's too slow. It's bogged down. So uh, that's what I'm uh, I'm working on. But uh, yeah, I'm not. And, and and it's not you know it's not quite to the point where I'm showing other people mm-hmm. uh, you know how how it works. But I'm I've been just cutting, 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 and getting a, a system that's a little bit more. Uh, streamlined so Mm. that's kind of what i'm doing with uh uh my board game but um as far as my favorite board games uh obviously i like i like a lot of bidding games i like bidding games seem to be uh very interesting uh aladdin's dragons uh modern art is 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 a very abstract uh board game um oh my gosh There, there there's so many of them um, I'm trying to like, what are the board games that I really, really like that, uh, uh, oh my gosh, I'm drawing a blank, I think, but I like, it's kind of funny. It's not so much the game I like. I like the mechanics. Hmm. Uh, I like when somebody comes up with a, with a new board game mechanic that is, uh, just elegant, hmm. you know, and it doesn't take a lot of rules or systems or stuff like that to, 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 to enjoy it. So, uh, yeah, you know, Aladdin's Dragons is is probably just a good standard. You know, it's it's not going to blow you away or anything, but it's just just a simple board game. Uh, Citadels was probably we had game night at Blizzard every Wednesday, and then it changed every Thursday. But uh, that was the uh, the day off that at six o'clock we would go get some food outside the building, play in a conference room, and we would just pick apart uh, the. We spent all our time actually picking apart the game mechanics as we were playing. And uh, the most popular uh, game was a, a card game uh, called uh, Citadels, which was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. It also was very flexible. I think it went up to, to seven or eight players. Um, so you could actually – it wasn't a lot of setup. It was just a really quick, uh, interesting uh, way to uh, play cards. So. And Dungeons and Dragons was obviously a huge influence on you, and oh, I'm sure yeah. a lot there of people were Blizzard. Games. Oh yeah, many games of D and D. Yeah, I played a Paladin at Eric Dodds's uh, game. Uh, Paladin was uh, Ignatius uh, that I based off of a uh, a character uh, uh, in char- uh, in Confederacy of Dunces. Uh, uh, there's a character called Ignatius, so it was totally an ins- insane Paladin. So uh, it was a lot of fun. John, I, 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 it's been so much fun talking uh, to you. I, I really, I, I would not let you off the line if I didn't have another interview to run to <laughs> now. Because it's funny enough, it's, I'd be interested to hear what you say about this. Um, I've actually got someone coming on in about five to ten minutes who oh, was a core member of the Nostalrius team who was in the room at Irvine for that meeting with Blizzard when they broke down ah. over five hours what was going on with the private oh, service scene. Oh, he yeah. might know. <laughs> okay, yeah. he might know what I know. Well, yeah, he might. You never know. So uh, we'll have to uh, see if the, the stars align and I can feel figure out what this uh, secret piece of information is. But look, John, what I'm trying to say is I, I thank you so much for taking all this time out for Countdown no to Classic. Um, it was a lot I, of fun. I couldn't be happier to have scooped the instance as well. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> well, they don't know I exist, so <laughs> you, 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 might, uh, have them, you might have a couple of years on them. No, so, I, uh, I appreciate it. Uh, well, John, all I can right. say is um, I, the worst part is I've left, and this happens every interview, I've left so many questions on the scrapping, on, on the cutting room floor. And that's, you know, how interviews yeah, generally go. You, you go goes. with the flow. Right. Um, but well, we're, I'm going to be shipping this on Amazon after the Kickstarter. Uh, mm-hmm. So if you want to uh, pick up and after you've read the whole book, you know, a little, little bit more thoroughly, have more questions that will eventually be on the cutting room floor you can uh, you can ask me again <laughs> i would love nothing more than that john so obviously i'll say to everyone please um well i have out they hear it from you one more time why don't you give a bit more of a plug for the book and when people can expect oh. it uh, oh yeah <laughs> yeah um i am uh promoting <laughs> a kickstarter august uh, 28th uh 2 p.m eastern standard time is when it uh, goes live and uh, we're looking for uh, people who want to uh, know how games are really made. So uh, this is the WoW Diary. Um, yeah, check out whenitsready.com is my uh, 
uh, website, but uh, check out Kickstarter um, August 28th. Fantastic. And, and I can just double down on what John is saying there, everyone. And, and, and you all know me. I'm not the kind to sit here and, and kiss guests' asses. Um, but I have read this book and, and I really did enjoy it. So please, if you have the time, if you, if you have something, um, that, that you'd like to see produced, uh, if, you, if you have an interest in John's book, I can't recommend it more. Please do get behind this project because what I've got here has been just a, a super fantastic read and I've really enjoyed it. John, thank you so much again. I would love to get you back when the book comes out and and pick up on a part two a part two of this chat if that's okay with you <laughs> well it's a pleasure talking to you thank you very much for having me thanks john all right, all right. uh i'll speak to bye you bye. later mate bye bye well that's the interview with john dunn and that's the show for the day and thank you so much again to john for taking so much time out for countdown to classic i really do appreciate that effort from him i thought he was phenomenal and that's why i really do encourage you all to keep an eye out for john's kickstarter campaign starting on august 28th over at kickstarter.com where you can find all the details about the book that he's releasing soon and as i said in the interview i've read about the first third or so of it and it is phenomenal and something i will be supporting without any hesitation whatsoever and i really do encourage the community to get behind this because it's quite frankly the kind of historical document and retelling of the making of one of the greatest games of all time that i think we need so please do show john your support over there i will be sending out further reminders here on the show and on Twitter and things of the like. But before I let you all go, I do hope you've enjoyed the show and thanks so much again to the Countdown Council, Borzen, Flozy B, Raidmar, Palfurus, Permadrunk, Rarebit, The Anton, Wilson Ma and Velarco. Thank you so much for your phenomenal support of the show. Countdown to Classic would not be getting interviews like this with John without the support that you show. Also a big thank you to supporters Bossman764, Herbert, Good Kiss Myrtle Banks, Purgatos81 and Zudamos as always I look forward to seeing you all again on Thursday when I speak to Nostalrius Core member Nano all about what happened in that meeting over at Irvine two years ago between Blizzard and the Nostalrius team and I can tell you it is an absolutely amazing blow by blow account of what happened in that room so if you've ever said the words ah I wish I was a fly on the wall for that meeting Well, guess what? Now you get your chance. So please tune in again on Thursday for that one. It's really a phenomenal chat that I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed. But until then, I'll sign off for now. See you later, everyone.